Would you ask Mr. Lay to come back in, please? Thank you. Right, Mr. Lay? Yes, thank you. On we go then, thank you. Yes, Ms. Grange? Yes, thank you. Just one short question, and then we'll go back to the topic that we were on. Okay. Um, should any allowance have been made for um, the, the efficiency of the fan to degrade over time? Is that something that designers ought to factor into their calculations? Um, I, I'm not a fan specialist to that right. level, so I, I really Don't know. couldn't answer that. But okay. I, yeah, no, sorry, I wouldn't know. No, I understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, and regular maintenance, sorry, just to say your maintenance checks, I think that set out the British standard, maybe your annual checks might pick that up because you ought to check flow rates and stuff like that. So. Yeah. We wouldn't necessarily allow for it, I would say. No. You'd have to check it every now and then. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, before we broke off, we were talking about uh, leakage rates, etc. and you asked if you could go to figure 75 at page 166 of Dr Lane's supplemental report. So that's at BLARP 2, 5043, mm -hmm. page 166. I think this is where she is analysing her measurements of window openings. Yeah. Do you see that? I do. There was a point you wanted to make about this, you said. So it was something that, that you said, that you said that once the door, once the window area got bigger than the door area, it didn't matter. Yeah. Could you bring the equation up again, please? Um, so was it the equation where we looked at the... Your the, little, the little diagram, that I said was quite a nice diagram with the green and yes. the blue squares. Yes, so that's That'll page uh, 160. Mm -hmm. I think I probably need to explain something that's a little bit counterintuitive. Oh, that'll do. That's. Is it? It's either 160 or possibly 161 is the diagram. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So if we zoom in a bit, perhaps just underneath where it says at flat. Yes. So you can see that equation there. Yeah? Yes. So, so if you had. So if we, if, we, if we take what you said to me, which is that Dr. Lane's assumed that because the window was bigger than the door, it didn't matter. Yeah. So if we have, say, um, a window that's um, five square metres and a door that's four square metres, yeah. it doesn't matter, the window anymore. Yeah? Yeah. Um, but if you had it the other way around, a door that's five square metres and a window that's four square metres, it does matter. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, that's not the case. So if you look at that equation, so you look at your A1, A2, A3, it's a little bit blurry. It doesn't matter what order your restrictions are in. Right. So this might sound a bit weird, but if you had, for example, two doors of exactly the same area, but one in series with the other, which is what you're looking yep. at here, you still get restric restriction in flow. You still have to take into account the second door. Right. So once the area you're considering gets big enough, you can effectively assume it's infinitely big. Yeah. And then infin infinity squared, one over infinity squared, drops to zero. And then that term stops having an effect. I think that's what Dr. Lane is saying. Yeah, but you need to be substantially bigger than the door for that to work. Right. I so if we go back to that diagram now. Yep. So, uh, sorry, the, um, the one with the with different window drawing? Ah, yes. Sorry. So if we go to, I think it's 7, um, 6 on page 169. Mm-hmm. That one? Uh, no, it's the one that's got the little red areas telling us how the window areas were worked out. Oh, sorry. That's 166. OK. So we can't see the full width there, but you've got a window, which consists of the window frame and the glazed units, and then next to it, which is a sort of um, diagonal shading, is a, an infill panel, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So in most cases, the infill panels I think at Grenfell Tower survived. Um, when, when, you, when, you, when you think about what the building looks like after the fire, a lot of those infill panels I think are still there. Well, there are different, in, there are old yeah. infill panel, in, window infill panels behind new window infill sure. panels. Sure, okay, yeah, but there was something that would have stayed there to restrict the flow. Right. Okay, um, so the biggest area you could have had would have been 1.35 square metres, but Dr. Lane says the maximum is so big that you don't have to take it into account as a flow restriction. So even if I assumed it was twice that, which is roughly the size of the infill panel, 
plus the window area, bearing in mind the window panels didn't disappear, and the area below the sill was concrete and yes. didn't disappear, you'd end up with an area of your external vent um, to outside, roughly twice the size of the, of the door area. Yes. Yeah? That's still big enough to influence that equation. Right. And in I fact, you end up with something like about a, um, I think... I did a quick calculation in my head, and I think it's somewhere between 12 and 15% flow reduction. Okay. Which, when we come back to that diagram you brought up just now, which is Dr. Lane's little yeah. bar chart, I think Dr. Lane calculated that with her maximum area, yes. which is bigger than the biggest window area, which means it's including failure of an area that didn't fail in the fire, um, I think she got to a velocity of 1.9 metres on level four. 1.9 metres per second. So it is quite significant that if you had that bigger by 12 or 15%, because it would have pushed it back over the 2 metres right. per second that Dr Lane is critical of. I see. OK, thank you for that. Well, look, we can, we can ask... Sorry, there's a lot of mass. I apologise no, no. to the... I can put that to her tomorrow. Sorry. That's fine. Yeah. Um, so let's go to figure 7.7 seven of Dr Lane's supplementary report, 173. And what she's done, we, we were just on this before we broke. So what she's done in this figure um, is to indicate how sensitively, sensitive the stair door velocity is to the introduction of further leakage pathways. And on the left-hand side of this diagram, we've got the different floor levels from ground to 23. Mm -hmm. And then for each floor uh, stair door, we've got the air velocity across the stair door in different circumstances. In grey, that's the open stair door velocity measured during the commissioning process. Mm -hmm. So we can see that in many instances, more than two metres per second was measured during the commissioning, yes? Yes. And then in orange, we've got the velocity assuming a flat door opening of 1.75 metres squared, a kitchen door opening of 1.5 metres squared, and a window opening of 0.25 metres squared. That's your one of your cases in orange. Yeah, yeah. Which, if, if I remember rightly, when I put those together, I had a look at what other modelling had been done in this area. I think Professor Torero used a similar sort of figure for the window breakage when he was looking at the initial fire development in flat 16. It was in the back of one of his reports. I can't remember which one. Oh, Sorry, I apologise. Yes. Yeah. And then in blue, the velocity with a smaller flat door opening, the same kitchen door opening, and a larger window opening of 1.35 metres squared. And then in yellow, this is the worst case scenario of Dr Lane. Do you see that? Which is the one we were just discussing. Flat door opening of 1.4 metres squared, kitchen door opening of 1.5 metres squared, and no window opening assumed. Right. Yeah, so the blue is the maximum window opening size. Yeah. And the yellow presumes there's nothing beyond the kitchen door. Yeah. Okay. Now, first question, should PSB have ca carried out calculations like this? Um, I'm, well... If you were calculating the system, then um, you would probably not do this sort of calculation. You'd probably do a computational model that would do this calculation effectively for you. Well, we've got no evidence that either of those things mm -hmm. were done. Um, should one or, or other of those have been done? Well, I think there's, there's two things to ask here. First of all, this diagram's got a big red line for two metres per second on it. So it presumes that two metres per second has to be achieved in all these conditions for the system to work. Well... That was PSB's performance criteria set out in its technical specification, wasn't it? It was that it would achieve two metres per second, and I think Mr Marnie has said that that was when everything else was closed because they wanted to derive the extract rate from that. Yes. So what I think Dr Lane's analysis here ignores is that there is also extraction going on at the same time, and that might produce a lower door velocity requirement. So are you saying that... Sorry, I don't think I understand Sorry. that. OK, so the way these systems work is that they extract some of the smoke. Yes. They induce a flow through the doorway. Yes. And they dilute the smoke, which changes its temperature and its, its um, obscuration as well. So um, you don't need necessarily two metres per second at the door if you're also extracting some of that smoke. You get a combined effect... Yes, I think Mr Marnie said as long as they were extracting three metres per second at the vent, then he would be happy with that. Is I that think that right? was the number he used, yeah. 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 I, I think that's probably a little bit low, and I think they were getting more than that, but I, I think a slightly bigger number than what I've normally used. But, um, but yeah, as so long as you're getting enough extraction, 
which I think was also Mr. Hansen's point, and he kept going on about that um, yes. uh, l- 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 later on in the design. But so, it's one of the difficulties with that, that they never measured that extract rate during commissioning. They measured the stair flow rate, hmm. the, the, the line that's, that should be the two metres per second. Yes, but if but you no, measure... Sorry, sorry, let me finish my question. Mm-hmm. But no readings were taken of the extract rate through the extract fans... Uh, vents themselves. Yeah, but if we go back to the discussion we had about leakage pathways, if you measure a velocity at the door, which is your your dominant leakage pathway, and you're getting enough flow through that door to give you the extraction rate that you think you need, yeah, then um, you must be getting at least that extraction rate. In fact, you're probably getting slightly more than that extraction rate because you've got a flow velocity coming through other leakage pathways that you haven't measured. So, if your objective is to get enough extraction rate, then just measuring it at the door will tend to underestimate the overall extraction rate that you're actually achieving. So it's, it's not illogical to do it that way. And it's a very easy thing to measure when you're commissioning, particularly in a live building, because you don't want to keep knocking on everyone's doors to open their windows and, um, and, and make, measure the flow. It would be very disruptive. Well, let me put my question a different way. Is there any justification for not having performed these calculations, given how sensitive the stair door airflow is to an individual flat door being open? Not do, I, do you know what? I, I don't think in all my life of, of designing a smoke control system, I've ever actually, um, well, not, not for a very long time, if I sat down and done this hand calculation, because you would typically do it by computer modelling. And a lot of people have done a lot of computer modelling of these types of systems. And as I think I explained earlier, that's tended to lead to some people considering that there's enough information out there to say that for a given extract rate, that's good enough. So um, can we break it down in stages? We don't have any evidence that hand calculations were done. We've got no documentation showing they were done, have we? No. We've got no documentation showing that computer modelling was done, have we? Um, not for this particular project, no. So are you saying that it came down to the designer's experience of designing systems like this and making sure there was enough allowance in the system? I think that, that appears to be what Mr Marnie did, yes. And are you saying that that was an, a, a reasonably acceptable situation? I'm saying I think it has become an acceptable situation. Um, I don't think it's the right way of designing these systems, but I appreciate that I am one viewpoint. If you'd come in as an advisor on this design and you'd seen mm-hmm. no hand calculations and no computer modelling, would you have been happy to sign off on PSB specification? Um, I've, I've faced exactly that sort of situation numerous times. And, and no, I would either insist that I did the modelling work or that somebody did the modelling work and presented it to me. Now, if we look at the commissioning data, this is at RBK 403784. This is the, sorry, RBK, yes. So these are the figures that Mr. Partlow um, came up with when he did his commissioning for the levels at Grenfell Tower. And we can see we've got the open door metres per second figure uh, in the second column after the floor level. And then we've got the low grill, low speed, low grill, high speed, high grill, low speed, high grill, high speed. Now, a point that I think you make at paragraph 74 on page 15 of your latest witness statement is that if you went for, for example, 51% of the level four data, 51% being, I think, Dr. Lane's second scenario and how much... The maximum window failure scenario, yeah. um, Then that would be 4.2 metres per second down to 2.14 metres per second. So you make the point that for level four, you'd still get more than two metres per second through the stair door, yes? Yeah, and I think that's on that, the bar chart diagram you had just now. Yes. Now, but the point I want to put to you is that's fine for level four, Mm -hmm. but it's not fine for lots of the other levels, is it? If you take around 50% off this figure, you get, for example, let's pick level 23, Mm-hmm. It was measuring an open stair door velocity of three metres per second, so half of that is 1.5. You don't get your two metres per second. Uh, so um, isn't that cherry-picking level four and saying, ah, oh, well, for level four where the fire started, it would be OK, but ignoring the fact it wouldn't be OK for lots of the other levels? OK, so um, I received Dr Lane's latest report um, 
frankly, very late. I've done what I can to review that report, and I wanted to provide something in advance of appearing here um, just to, to help set this out. Now, what I didn't want to do is present the panel with 23 loads of calculations and further analyses. I didn't think that would be very helpful in a witness statement. I can certainly go through and um, do those calculations, and, and, and I will do, but I've also included another calculation within my witness statement that makes the point that two metres per second is not necessarily the right criteria to be using. Yes, I'll come on to that point in okay. a moment. In right. a minute, I think you try and justify a one metre per second flow rate through the door. I'll well, come to that point in a minute. Mm -hmm. But just sticking with these figures, it's not a complex calculation to do, is it? Hmm. You've picked out level four, and you've said that half of 4.2 at level four is 2.14. Uh, yeah, I've, I've chosen level four not because it's the biggest number, because it isn't. I've chosen it because that was where the fire was on. Yes, but if the fire had started at level 23 or level 17 or a number of other levels and we take a 50% figure, it would fall well below the two metres per second, wouldn't well, it? Well, presuming, of course, that everything else that happened to lead to that particular flow path happened, then you might end up with a flow velocity through the doorway of less than two metres per second, yes. Yes. Now, let's look at what you say in your latest statement. That's LAY uh, 703 at page 14. And I want to look at what you say at paragraph 70 and 71. Mm -hmm. So you say, um, in her report, Dr Lane refers to reports produced by Colt, which relate to the protection of the stairs by a smoke control system similar to the system, by which I mean they employed extraction from the lobby with inlet via the stair, as noted in Dr Lane's report, the Colt reports were relied upon for smoke control system designs in residential buildings. The Colt CFD report states that protection to the stair was achieved when the mass flow rate drawn through the door when their smoke control system design was operating was 1.9 kilograms per second, which for ambient air through a 1.6 metre square single leaf door opening would equate to a flow velocity of one metres per second. This matches the velocity shown in the computer modelling images in the report. <coughs> Hence, either a flow velocity significantly less than two metres per second alone can prevent smoke movement to a stair, or a lower flow rate in combination with the other mechanisms, extraction and dilution, can achieve a combined effect which results in a lower flow velocity being necessary to protect the stair. My experience suggests that the latter is the case. So are you now saying that, in fact, the key flow velocity across the stair door was one metre per second, not two metres per second, as shown in PSB's design documentation. So what I'm saying is what I've said in my main report, which is that there is more to this than simply worrying about the flow velocity, that these systems produce the effect they will provide the protection to the staircase through extraction, dilution, and the flow velocity. Okay? Now, what I've used there is, I thought it might be convenient to use the same reports that Dr Lane had <coughs> and look at the flow velocities that those reports show. And those reports show a flow velocity of one metre per second or, or thereabouts through the doorway, and that is providing adequate protection to the staircase. And those reports have been used to justify residential systems, I think, for the type approval for the Colt system. I think that's what Dr Lane confirms in her report. Yes. So there are situations for residential buildings using this type of system where one metre per second is considered to be acceptable. You say there's more to this than simply the flow velocity through the stair door, but that was the only performance criterion that was identified by PSB in its design documentation, wasn't it? Yes, but as I understand it, that's because that was what they were testing when they were commissioning and verifying the system. Well... It wasn't just what they were testing, it's what they set out in all the versions of their design documentation from version 0 through to version 6, including the version provided to building control. It said that uh, the performance criteria would be to achieve a flow through the stair of two metres per second. But as Dr Lane has pointed out, they didn't say that was going to be achieved when the flat door was open. And as I understand Mr Marley's evidence, that he intended to use that velocity to check that he got adequate extraction Yes. Are you only saying now that one metres per second is acceptable? Because Dr Lane has shown through her calculations that on many levels, the two metres per second would not be met with certain door opening and leakage conditions. Well, I'm responding to Dr Lane's report, um, which has required me to do some further calculations. 
but the principles that you can have a lower door velocity because you're also extracting smoke are set out in my original report in a number of places. Hasn't Dr Lane's calculations shown, haven't they shown, that even if you accept that the sole performance criterion was protection of the stair, this system potentially failed to achieve that for foreseeable door opening scenarios? No, it doesn't, because it doesn't consider all the mechanisms that lead to protection of the stair. It only considers one of them, which you, is the flow when, velocity. And when you say all the mechanisms, you're talking about some extraction of smoke from the lobby, which would indirectly protect the stair. Is that what you're talking so about? So some extraction of smoke, which reduces the amount of smoke getting to the staircase. There's a dilution effect, which cools the smoke and reduces the um, velocity that you need to achieve to stop smoke going into the staircase. And there is the opposing flow that's generated. I see. Can, can I just check that I've understood this? I think what you're saying is that if you, if you Mr. Marnie or anyone else come to that, designing a system, you would design it to criterion, uh, to criteria which included two metres a second inflow through the stair door with no other doors open, that, that giving you a certain um, flow rate to, to um, achieve. But you might at the same time be aware that with a flat door open and a window open to the outside, the flow rate would not be as high as two metres but you would regard that as acceptable? I, th I think that's what, what you'd have to presume, yeah, yeah. I mean, whenever I specify one of these systems, the, the, or systems like this, the, the, the number that you actually end up specifying to pass on to the, the system provider is an extraction rate. You will tell them that I would like this extraction rate to be achieved from this space, um, and I might make some initial calculations for how big the shafts need to be. Typically, we oversize them. And, but then... Within my model, I might have some more distinct numbers, such as a velocity that I'm expecting to achieve through a staircase that's demonstrated that the protection has been provided. But the critical number that I would pass on to a system, a detailed system designer, should we call them, a supplier, is the extraction rate. Yeah. So does it come to this, that although one would be designing a system like this to, let's say, two metres a second inflow across the stair door, that does not involve an acceptance that two metres a second flow across the stair door is essential to enable, the, under all circumstances, to enable the system to, to be effective. Yeah, that, that's exactly my experience, yes. Sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When um, Beryl Menzies gave her evidence um, about the smoke control system, she was clear that a cold smoke test was an important part of the commissioning and acceptance of the system by building control. And she said that it wouldn't be possible to know whether the system worked, including for the different door opening conditions, which were foreseeable, without such a cold smoke test. Now, I appreciate what you've said about the design process and the fact you might make some assumptions, but doesn't that mean that it's extremely important that you then go on and test whether the assumptions that you're making about smoke clearance or whatever in the lobby mm -hmm. are correct? So if you go back sort of 15, 20 years ago when people first started putting in different mechanical ventilation systems compared to the standard guidance, yeah, a lot of smoke testing was being done. Um, and I think some people still do smoke testing today. But personally, I wouldn't expect to see smoke testing being done when I was witnessing and commissioning a system because I would take velocity readings and extract readings and I would compare them to my analyses or previous analyses that had been carried out. Um, I don't really know what a cold smoke test would actually tell you in this instance. Um, well, let's take it back to the Grenfell situation. We didn't have calculations and analyses for mm -hmm. building control to look at and decide whether or not they were happy with the velocity through the stairs mm -hmm. or the extract rate, etc. So in the absence of such calculations, um, do you agree with Miss Menzies that it was very important to be carrying out something like a cold smoke test so you could see what the effects were, albeit in, in much more limited situations? I think if I wanted to convince someone that my system was, was absolutely marvellous and was, was brilliant at doing what it wanted to do, I'd do a cold smoke test because it really underplays the conditions that the system's exposed to. It's much tougher just to look at the velocities um, because yeah, the velocities are based back on previous analyses that assume hot smoke and, and fire. So I don't, honest, honestly, I don't think a cold smoke test is critical at all to these sorts of systems. 
So the answer is no, you don't agree with uh, no, Ms no. Menzies? No, I've, I've, I mean, I've, I've worked with Beryl Menzies before. We've, we've done coal smoke testing together on a project. We were looking primarily at a dilution effect in that case, and we were looking to see how quickly a space cleared of smoke. And in that case, it can be quite useful and quite interesting because you're not modelling something that's dissimilar to the real smoke condition. But if you're looking to model or to test and compare against hot smoke emerging from a doorway into a lobby and stopping it going into a staircase, a cold smoke test doesn't really, that, that, it's not equivalent to that. I appreciate it not, it's not equivalent, but would it not be an important thing to do in the absence of calculations? Um, well, no, because it's, it's not a relevant test, I don't think. Would you agree that a failure to carry out that cold smoke test was compounded by the failure to measure airflow velocity at the dampers themselves? Um, I think measuring the airflow velocity at the dampers, um, well, the airflow velocity at the dampers was measured, wasn't it? You've got that, that chart has the airflow velocities at the grills. I think it's measuring the difference between the pressure on one side and the other side. No, I think it's a velocity measure. It's a, it's a velocity measure. Well, I think so. Right, it's... okay. So it was measured. Can you check? We'll just check Mr. Marnie's evidence on whether or not... Yeah, um, oh, we, we could bring up the table that yeah. we had just now. That will tell us. Um, yeah, it's RBK 403784. I think I commented on, in my report as well, because it's not clear. I think uh, Granville Partlow was, was, was quite clear when he did the door velocities that he used an averaging method and took quite an accurate measure of the door velocity, but he was less clear about the measurements at the grill velocities at each individual damper. Yes. Um, which means they're probably not as accurate, I suspect, as the door velocity mm. measurement. But they give you if, – if you, if you measure each one of them, but not in quite the right way, you still get the balance across them, I suspect. Right. If we look at your report, page 278 – I'm sorry, but we've, we've got the um, figures on the screen. Did you want to say anything about them? No, no, I just want to check – because my, my, my recollection was that these are velocities, and they are this low grill okay. speed. It's the air velocity. Yeah. Yeah. Can Damn. we just look at what you say at page 278, paragraph – Four, 942, please, of your report. Mm -hmm. um, you say, as the system used an atypical arrangement of fans and the damper locations were a legacy of the existing system's design, a sensible additional check would have been to measure airflow's velocity at the dampers to check that airflow was occurring as intended. I think that's one of the things I was thinking of about right. it not having been done. What, what are you referring to there about the sensible additional check, which... Well, I think that measuring the airflow at each of the dampers is a sensible additional check. Right. Yeah. So not just one airflow measurement at each of the dampers, each of the vents. I think what I'm explaining there is that if you're only interested in achieving the extract rate, or well, that's what you're really interested in, you only really need to measure the flow through the door. Because like I said earlier, that's likely to underestimate the actual total extract rate that you're achieving. So that's a, a good thing. But it's sensible to measure the airflow at the dampers as well, um, because that tells you um, whether the air is going where you, where you expect it to go. And that's and what we did. Yeah. yeah. And just to be clear, that would be multiple um, measurements at each vent, would it? If you wanted a, an accurate measure, yeah, you have to. It's quite difficult to measure um, accurately airflow on a relatively small vent. Um, because of the, again, I think I explained this in my report, there's, there's challenges associated with measuring airflows. But, again, provided you're consistent with your measuring method, at least it tells you what, effectively, the ratio of, of airflow is into the different types of vents. Right. And it yeah. doesn't look like that was done, does it? It doesn't look like airflow at each of the dampers was measured. Well, that's what the data in the table was. That's a measurement at each of the dampers. I see. I thought, you, I thought you were making clear that the vent as a whole was difficult to get a measurement and you needed to get more individual measurements with it. No, no, I, so no, I don't mean that. Right, OK. Now, Dr Lane has also expressed some concern that the system as designed by PSB might have the effect of drawing smoke from the fire flat into the lobby and making conditions for the residents worse in the lobby. And in her supplemental report, she raises a particular concern that the way the system was designed might have meant that if a flat door was open and the stair door was closed, the system could carry on operating at high level with the fans on high because the pressure difference between the stair and the lobby would have been lost due to the open flat door as opposed to the open stair door. And that could lead to the phenomenon of, of smoke being sucked from the flat into the lobby. 
Now, is that something that you think uh, was potentially enough of a concern that it ought to have been specifically considered as part of the design? So I would say it's a potential scenario, but for that scenario to occur, you do need your window to have failed. You need, in this flat configuration, you need the kitchen door to be open, and you would also need the flat door to be open. And I think I'm right in saying, um, whilst we know a lot of the flat doors, unfortunately, failed open, um, I think there was a statement I think it really recently may have been Mr. in Dr. Purser's recent report. I think most residents actually closed the kitchen doors behind them, particularly those in the, the corner flats that evacuated early on. Um, so you wouldn't have that flow occurring because you'd have a doorway between, or a closed door between the fire and the, and the extraction system. You've also got a situation whereby your internal door to your kitchen tends to open into the kitchen, I think they did in the Grenfell Tower, and your front door to your flat opens into the flat. So the airflow, any airflow you generate is actually going to tend to close those doors. So I think what you're saying is that could be a problem, but it would depend It's a thi on, sorry. That it, would depend on what the door opening conditions might be in the flat itself. It's a theoretical scenario, but it's not one that should occur. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily expect a designer to take it into account. Or, or even consider it? Um, well, that's what taking into account means. So, yeah, I would expect them to consider it, yeah. OK. Now, when Mr Marnie gave oral evidence to the inquiry, he explained that m the Max Fordham proposal for the system, which was essentially retaining the original design intent of the system as a push-pull one, pushing in air from the south and extracting from the north, wouldn't work at Grenfell Tower. And he raised a number of potential problems with that. I'm going to summarise. He said there'd be excessive pressure drop, like uh, he used the analogy of an old quart into a pint pot. He said there could be velocity jets created across the lobby which could push smoke towards the stairs. And he says that such a system, a push-pull system, is much more suitable for a corridor system uh, where you might get dead ends. Um, and, sorry, that Grenfell, you might get dead ends here because of the eye shape of the lobbies, and so push-pull is less satisfactory. So he gave a number of reasons why he thought a push-pull system, as proposed by Max Fordham, wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. Do you essentially agree with those concerns, or do you think further consideration should have been given to a push-pull system? Um, I, I think to get a push-pull system to work, you would need um, bigger extract um, extraction rates than you would need for the system that was actually put in there. I think I explained that in my, in my report. But, um, yeah, I mean, we, we would typically use push-pull systems in long corridor situations. You do have to worry about the dead-end condition. You tend to have to try and get your extraction shafts into those sort of dead-end areas. And you have to be very aware of, of having a good separation between your shaft and, and the staircase um, because you don't want to um, shortcut the, the flows that you're achieving, etc. So, and I mentioned, I think, one of the paragraphs you showed me earlier talked about the challenges of the building physics with those sorts of systems and the such like. So you agree with Mr Marnie, do you, that push-pull wasn't an adequate solution for Grenfell Tower? Well, if you could install a push-pull system, it might be an adequate system, um, but I think you would need much bigger extraction rates. Um, so I, I doubt it would have been an achievable system. Right. Now, given all the complexities of the design that we've discussed, including that this was a bespoke system, do you think that those involved with the refurbishment, including Exova, Max Fordham and PSB, should have made sure that a computer fluid dynamics CFD analysis of the proposed system was carried out? My preference, I think I've said this about 10 times, is yes, that sort of analysis should be carried out. And did it fall below the standards reasonably to be expected of those bodies not to ensure that a CFD analysis was carried out? Again, as I said, um, I wish I could say that it did fall below those standards, but unfortunately I think that has become the norm. Yes, something might be the norm, but it might still fall below reasonably acceptable standards. So you could have a prevalence of poor practice. Yeah, so OK, so I would say there's Thinking a about it like that... Just because it's prevalent doesn't necessarily mean it's acceptable. Mm -hmm. In your view, did it fall below reasonable standards not to do a CFD analysis here? I would say there's a prevalence of poor practice in that area. So I think you're saying, yes, it did, but lots of other people were doing that at the same time? Yes. Yeah. Now, you tell us in your report that the PSB technical proposal, you describe it as light on detail, that's at paragraph 504 of your report, page 161. 
Um, and if we go to page 192, para 640, you say there, uh, I consider it a deficiency in the technical submissions provided by PSB that the specification standard used for their design of the system was not explicitly defined. Similarly, PSB did not provide a consistent or thorough statement of which standard was applied for each component of the system. Some of the equipment was stated as needing to meet standards, some was not. Some of the selected components are stated as meeting standards, some were not. Um, now, would you have signed off on the technical submission prepared by PSB for the system at Grenfell Tower? Well, it's my, not my job to sign off anything. I'm not a building control body. But um, if I was, for example, a technical reviewer um, for a project, I would have asked for more detail to be included. Yeah. So can we agree that that technical submission didn't contain the information about the system which you would expect from a reasonably competent designer of such a system? I, I didn't think it did, no, no. Now, just in terms of your conclusions, um, if we look at paragraph 22 of your report on page 17, this is your conclusions about the design of the system. You say at paragraph 22 that there were significant constraints at the tower. And then in the last three lines, you say, consequently, I consider that the system which focused on protecting the stair by using both shafts for mechanical extraction was the most appropriate design response. Does that remain your evidence? I've not seen anything to change that, no. Yeah. And you say at paragraph 23, I've not been able to identify any appropriate smoke control system design capable of installation within the constraints of the tower, which could have explicitly addressed both the lobbies and the stair, maintaining tenable conditions in both at the same time. Again, does that remain your evidence? Yes, it does. Thank you. Now, dampers and compartmentation. I want to turn to that topic now. And I want to start by exploring some areas of agreement between you and Dr. Lane in relation to protected shafts and dampers. Um, if we can go to her supplemental report at page 11, so that's BLARP 25043, page 11. If we look at 1.3.27 on that, towards the bottom of that page, she says, Mr. Lay agrees that the smoke shafts and ductwork of the smoke ventilation system in Grenfell Tower were required to be a protected shaft as described in ADB 2013. That's correct, yes? Um, yeah, I think so, yeah. And does it follow from this that the extent to which the dampers prevent excessive smoke leakage from the shafts into the lobbies is an, is an important compliance and life safety matter? Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you also agree that the leakage potential of the system's dampers is important because the damper leakage will reduce the effectiveness of the extract fan? Not necessarily, no, because um, if you put all the dampers in and you've run the fan and you've got the extraction rates you want, then um, you must have overcome any leakage that was there. I see. So provided you've measured the extract and you, you're getting the numbers you want... Mm. If, if you were sorry, if you were designing the system on a piece of paper and handing it to someone, and you were reliant upon that design absolutely working, yes, you would have to take that leakage into account. If, however, you're specifying a fan and you've allowed sufficient um, capacity within that fan to overcome what you think is likely to be the expected leakage rate, then um, on your head be it, and you better hope it works and that you get the required extraction rate. Um, so you know it. it it's a difference there between someone who's sort of designing in an office and someone who perhaps has a bit more of a feel for what happens on site. Right, yes. Now, if we go to page 12 within Dr Lane's supplemental report um, and look at paragraph 1.3.34... She says there, we agree there is no evidence that the Gilbert Series 54, uh, and then in quotation marks, smoke evacuation dampers were tested or classified as smoke control dampers in accordance with BSEN 12101 Part 8, BSEN 13501 Part 4, and BSEN 1366 Part 10. Nor were they tested in full accordance with the test standard for fire, fire and smoke dampers, according to BSEN 1366 part 2. Um, and that's an area of agreement between you, yes? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's factually correct, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we look below that at 1.3.35, she says, um, we agree that the Gilbert Series 54 dampers installed had a leakage rate exceeding the smoke leakage, that's the S limit, 
of 200 cubic metres per second per metre square per hour for an ES-rated fire and smoke damper between 0 and 9 and after 54 minutes. Do you see that? Yes. Now, in this context, um, the designation E and the designation S have particular meanings. E means integrity, doesn't it? It does, yeah. And S means smoke leakage. Is yes, that right? Yes, correct, yeah. And you have to have both of those things specified for things like dampers because um, something which maintains integrity, like a, a fire door or, for example, a, um, a fire collar around a, a pipe or something, they can leak smoke. And is it right that you disagree with Dr Lane's conclusion that the dampers installed at Grenfell Tower were required to have both an E and an S certification? Yes, I do disagree with that. And specifically, it's your view that they didn't need to meet the S smoke leakage requirement, is that right? Uh, that's correct, yes. Yeah. Now, just to explore this E and S issue further, I want to ask you some questions about different damper types and where those classification requirements come from and what they're meant to show in practice. Now, first, if we look at approved document B again, CLG 50224 at page 144, this is within the Appendix E definition section of ADB. It defines a uh, fire damper. It's in the top right-hand column. Mm -hmm. And can you see it says a fire damper is a mechanical or intumescent device within a duct or ventilation opening, which is operated automatically and is designed to prevent the passage of fire which is, and which is capable of achieving an integrity E classification and or an ES classification. Do you see that? Yes. And then if we go to Dr. Lane's um, main smoke control report, at BLARP 2, 5035, at page 86. At paragraph 4.8.21, at the bottom of that page, we can see that she's got the definition there of a fire damper immediately above, and she says this... Uh, in that last paragraph, the purpose of a fire damper is to close and remain closed during a fire, preventing the passage of fire. It is required by ADB 2013 to protect openings created by ventilation systems in internal compartmentation. Do you see that? I see that, although I disagree with the word required in that paragraph. Um, OK, so subject yeah. to uh, it being guidance in ADB, mm -hmm. albeit statutory guidance... I don't think that makes any difference, sorry, but yeah. it's still a recommendation. But can we agree that the purpose of a fire damper is to close and remain closed during a fire? Yes. So fire dampers are not intended to open and close repeatedly as part of a system's normal operation, are they? Um, no. no. Then let's go to paragraph 10.15 of ADB. So back to ADB, CLG 50224 at page 88. And if we look at 10.15, there we have, um, it, it sets out um, something about fire dampers, and it says 10.15, fire dampers should be tested to BSEN 1366 Part 2, 1999, and be classified to BSEN 13501 Part 3, 2005. They should have an E classification equal to or greater than 60 minutes. Do you see that? Yes. So that's right. the approved document B definition of fire dampers, again, or... It's telling you what standards fire dampers have to be tested to. Yeah, I think so it's referred to from a, a note or a paragraph further up, isn't it? Yeah. And um, just to see what these E and ES classifications mean in more detail, if we go to the classification standard itself, uh, this is at BSI 50810... This is um, a British standard. It's EN 13501, Part 3, 2005, and it's headed Fire Classification of Construction Products and Building Elements. And then um, if we go to page 9 within this, it explains at 5.1.2 what the integrity means. 
Yeah. And it says integrity E is the ability of a component of a service installation to present, prevent the transmission of fire as a result of the passage of significant quantities of flame or hot gases from the fire to the unexposed side, thereby causing ignition either of the non-fire exposed surface or of any material adjacent to that surface. So the E, the integrity characteristic, is about the transmission of fire and preventing the ignition of whatever is on the unexposed side of the damper, for example, either due to hot gases or flames. Is that right? Yes, that's right, yeah. And if we turn on to page 10 of this standard, we see information about the S, the smoke leakage characteristic for fire and smoke dampers. And it says there under 5.1.4, S, smoke leakage. Smoke leakage, S is the ability of the component to resist the passage of gas, gases or smoke at ambient temperature and during exposure to the standard temperature time test. The leakage rate is corrected to 20 degrees C. Do you see that? I do, yeah. So can we agree that the smoke leakage measure, the S measure, is about limiting, although not completely preventing, the passage of smoke through the damper? Is that right? Um, it's about restricting it to a certain level. Because if you go back to the previous page you had, yep. part of the integrity only measure at the bottom there is a leakage rate for dampers that's specified at 360 cubic metres per metre square per hour. Yes. So when you add the <coughs> S classification, it changes that figure. It, it makes that figure tighter. It makes yes. it a, a, a less leaky damper. But So S rather than E is the relevant classification if we're looking at whether smoke leakage is excessive for residents evacuating on the other side of a, of a closed damper. Uh, no, I wouldn't necessarily say that. Why not? I'm not, not sure where that's come from. That's a big jump. Well, um, why isn't smoke leakage the relevant thing we should be looking at? as to whether or not the leakage is excessive for residents who are evacuating? Well, I mean, so for example, we have lots of penetrations through walls that don't have any smoke leakage um, specification provision. So I wouldn't necessarily presume that a, a specific smoke leakage requirement for a damper is something that you would necessarily require onto an escape route or something like that. Right. You wouldn't, would you? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily presume it um, just because of what's said in this particular standard. But I would have to work out whether or not a resistance to smoke coming through the wall is, is important. I mean, lots of things, when you test them, um, allow smoke to pass through them. You'd right. be quite surprised, I think most people would be quite surprised, that you can pass the integrity test with some... You, know, you can see the furnace through the holes, but you can still pass the integrity test. Um, and things like compartment walls are only tested to that standard. There's no smoke leakage... Um, expectation for a compartment wall so you could have this weird situation of having a damper that's resistant to smoke leakage in a wall that's not resistant to smoke leakage and then you have the production of smoke from construction products things like wooden fire doors produce quite a lot of smoke when they're heated up and so does things like certain construction materials as well I see so um, is what you're saying that because other elements of a building structure might leak smoke that means that you can effectively say that even though your damper is leading directly onto an escape route, it doesn't matter how resistant to smoke it is coming through those dampers. I wouldn't put it quite that far, um, but I would say that it's a relevant consideration, but you have to put it into the context of what's going on around it as well. Where, where do you get that from? Which piece of guidance says that? Well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to meet the functional requirements of the regulations, not a particular requirement. If there's a, if there's a piece of guidance that says you must make all your fire dampers um, smoke resistant um, onto an escape route, which I'm not aware of, um, then I would expect it to also say you should be worried about smoke coming through cracks in your construction as well, perhaps. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily follow one from the other. The question is, does a certain amount of smoke getting onto that escape route matter from a life safety perspective? Is it, does it represent a, an unreasonable risk to health and safety of people in the building? And, and it would be easier and simpler just to say, yes, it all has to be smoke sealed. But that isn't actually what the guidance says. It allows you to have variation from that. I see. Well, we'll keep going with the guidance and what it says. But are, are you saying it's your practice then with a damper that goes onto an escape route 
that you wouldn't worry about whether it has the S smoke leakage classification? I would, I would, it would depend on the exposure application that you're looking at. So um, I would prefer, and it's far simpler as an engineer, quite frankly, to define an ES type damper. I, that, that's what I would specify, or these days, because they've now become prevalent, I would specify a smoke control damper. But um, if you um, didn't have access to those for various reasons, and you needed to consider a damper with a lesser specification, then I would consider the application that damper is being used in. So, for example, is there a negative pressure in the shaft that that damper is into, in which case that would change the, you know, what would be an acceptable performance criteria. I see. Okay. So we looked at the definition of a fire damper, just a straightforward fire damper, and it only needed an E classification. Let's go back to ADB 2013 again, CLG 50224 and look at page 144, mm -hmm. and we've now got the definition of a fire and smoke damper below the fire damper. Again, this is in Appendix E, the definition section, and it says here, fire and smoke damper is a fire damper which, when tested in accordance with BSEN 1366 Part 2, 1999, meets the ES classification requirements defined in EN 13501, that's the standard we were just looking at, mm -hmm. and achieves the same fire resistance in relation to integrity as the element of the building construction through which the duct passes. Intermescent fire dampers may be tested and then there's another standard. So um, Dr. Lane has summarised the purpose of this type of damper as to, to be to close and remain closed during a fire where air handling ducts pass through fire separating elements protecting an escape route. Now, do you agree with that? That's one of the applications for that type of damper, yeah. And do you agree that this second type of damper is also intended to close and stay closed as with fire dampers, but this time it must also have a lower smoke leakage rate, hence the S classification? So from a, sorry, if you're using it in that application um, and for that purpose from a life safety perspective, yeah, you expect it just to close and stay closed. Yeah. Now, can we agree, looking at that description, that a fire and smoke damper with an ES classification has some direct relevance to the Grenfell Tower situation? Because, first of all, the vertical shafts for the smoke control system pass through the lobbies. And second, the lobbies are part of an escape route from Grenfell Tower that residents would need to use in the event of a fire. So I'd say an ES classified damper is one of the options that you could have used, yes. But can we also agree that at Grenfell Tower, the dampers weren't limited to closing and remaining closed during a fire because the system was designed to allow a manual override during a fire so that you could have it closed during part of the fire, but then the fire service would activate on another floor and the damper would open where previously it had been closed. Can we agree that? Um, so I think the, the manual intervention of smoke control systems is not, it's not well set out, is it? It's not something which... Sorry, I'm going to ask you to answer my question. Can well, we I think agree I that at Grenfell point, Tower, the dampers were not limited to closing and remaining closed during a fire? because the system was designed to allow a manual override of the system by the fire service. Can we agree that? To allow a manual override of some kind, yes. Well, what do you mean of some kind? We know that there were firemen's override switches that they could pop their key into mm -hmm. and activate the system to operate on a different level. So if the fire started on level four, the fire service might decide that actually they want uh, smoke control on level 11 or level 18 or level 23 and they could manually operate the system so that the dampers then opened on a different floor. That's right, isn't it? Well, that's what I was going to go on to explain when you, when you stopped me just now. Um, so I don't know fully what the intention of the manual override function was of the system and I don't think I've seen it fully documented. Um, I'd, and critically, I don't know whether the system was intended to be operated during a fire that spread to enable them to move the smoke control to a different floor, or whether it was simply intended that there was a capacity to have some smoke clearance after a fire, um, and they're two completely different exposure conditions. My understanding, um, and this is from discussions I've had on, on numerous projects with numerous firefighters, approvers, mechanical systems designers and the such like, is that 
these days, the control systems, control systems used to be really difficult and complex to design. These days, it's all just a programmable logic controller, so you can do pretty much anything you want. But actually, most of the functionality that's available in a smoke control system isn't of interest to the fire service. They, they like to keep it simple. And the fire service don't typically expect to move the floor of operation of the system, um, apart from perhaps in a, when the fire's put out in a smoke clearance capacity. So I think there's, there's, there's some important differentiation there that I, I honestly don't know exactly what the intention or what people expected the system to be able to do in that case. Okay, if the intention of those little yellow key boxes on each lobby was for the firemen to be able to override during a fire mm. and move the smoke control to a different level to assist them, if that's right, um, can we agree that those dampers potentially would need to open again when previously they were closed? So not just close and stay closed, but close and then open. Well, on the basis the system was designed to operate when there's only a fire in one floor and in one flat at a time, I doubt that was the intention. Um, but if that was the intention, then it would suggest that somebody was expecting the dampers to open and close under um, fire exposure conditions. I see. Let's go to the classification standard again, the 13501 Part 3 2005 standard, and the table shown on page 16. That's BSI 50810 at page 16. Here we've got a table which uh, provides some more information about the different performance criteria for fire-resisting dampers, table two. Mm -hmm. And we can see that for the first classification in the table E, the integrity, we can see the 360 uh, per metres cubed per hour per metre squared leakage limit for integrity. Do you see that? Yes. And then the next row down shows that for ES, for integrity and smoke, the, the maximum leakage limit is 200 metres cubed per hour per metre squared. Do you see that? Yes, at ambient temperature, yes. Yeah. And we can see from the columns um, showing the leakage limits at ambient temperature and, and during the fire test, I think, that it's, both, it's 200 for both. Do you see that? Leakage limit at ambient temperature is 200 max, and the leakage limit during the fire test, it says 200. That's for, so that's for an EIS? No, for ES, under the max. Oh, sorry, for the max one. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong row of the table. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if we go to the British Standard, which is dealing with fire resistance tests which is BSEN 1366, Part 10, 2011. This is at BSI 40177. This is Fire Resistance Test for Service Installations, Part 10, Smoke Control Dampers. If we go to page 12 and look at clause 3.27, and there's a definition here of a smoke control damper. And it says, smoke control damper, device automatically or manually activated, which can be open or closed in its operational position to control the flow of smoke and hot gases into, from, or within a duct. Do you see that? I do see that, although there's a different definition of a smoke control damper in BSEN 13501, part four, if I remember rightly. Right. Well, we can have a look at that if necessary. Um, let's go to paragraph, um, to back to Dr. Lane's report now, BLARP 25035 at page 90. In the, sorry, the reason I mentioned that is because the term smoke control damper, um, it has a plain English meaning that it had for, I think, a, num a long time, and then it was put into a standard when the standard came along, the standard sort of overwrote the plain English meaning. Yeah. But there are still versions within the BSI canon that, that refer to it as a smoke control damper. So pretty much any damper that's involved in a, uh, a ventilation system could be classed as a smoke control damper. It's, yes. a, ter it's a terrible but, but piece of language. By 2011, we've got this particular definition within BSEN 1366 Part 10 2011, haven't we? We have, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... Um, at paragraph 4.8.48 of Dr. Lane's report, sorry, I think it might be a page earlier, um, 
she says, the primary functional difference when comparing a smoke control damper with the other two types, so that's a fire damper and a fire smoke damper, is that a smoke control damper must be capable of opening and closing in the event of a fire. Now, do you agree with that? Looking at the definition as it applies to that 2011 British standard. Using the definition from um, that, that particular standard, yes. Yeah. And the difference is because this particular type of smoke control dampers need to be able to open or close depending on the location of a fire in a building. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> and can we agree that a smoke control damper is subject to the same ES requirements, particularly in respect of maximum permitted smoke leakage, as a fire and smoke damper? I think I'm right in saying a smoke control damper can have an S classification or not as well. Right. Now, do you agree that the features of smoke control dampers, namely one, being able to open and close during a fire, and two, being able to limit the amount of smoke passing through it to a specified maximum, match what the dampers at Grenfell Tower were meant to do? I can't really say that because I don't know if they were intended to open and close in the manner that a smoke control damper is in, anticipated to be used. So a smoke control damper is anticipated to be opened and closed at elevated temperatures, whereas if the intention of the opening and closing at Grenfell Tower was for smoke clearance purposes, you wouldn't expect that to be at an elevated temperature. So I, I can't say that that definitely lines up. Right. Now, do you agree that the dampers specified by PSB were Gilbert's dampers, which were not tested for closing and opening during a fire and didn't have an S smoke leakage classification? Um, they didn't have a, um, I don't think they were tested for a smoke leakage classification formally, so they didn't have a formal classification for smoke leakage, correct, yeah. I don't think they had any formal classification to any standard, did they? Uh, no, they didn't, no. They'd been no. tested to a test standard, but they'd modified the standard, yeah. Yes. Or, sorry, modified the test procedure. Yes, we're going to come to that in a moment. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the need for the S uh, classification, if we come back to the question of whether these S certified dampers were required at Grenfell Tower. Let's go back to ADB mm -hmm. at CLG 50224, and I want to look at page 61. Um, so it's 61 this time, and we look at paragraph 5.48 at the top of that page. And that says this, ducts passing through the enclosure of a protected escape route should be fire resisting i.e. the ductwork should be constructed in accordance with method 2 or method 3, see paragraph 10.9 below. And then there's a note below that. It says, fire dampers activated only by fusible links are not suitable for protecting escape routes. However, an ES classified fire and smoke damper, which is activated by a suitable fire detection system, may be used. See paragraph 10.15. Do you see that? I do see that, yeah. Now, can you help us first? There's a re reference that, there to a fusible link. What is a fusible link? So a fusible link is a um, typically a sort of a piece of solder or something like that, which fails at a given temperature. Um, so it fails once. So once it gets hot, so a, a, a fire damper activated by a fusible link would typically have some kind of hold open mechanism. So it might be a, um, a pneumatic hold open or a spring loaded hold open. And a bit like a, uh, uh, an old fashioned sort of gamekeeper's trap, um, there's a trigger which allows that to, to slam shut and the trigger is activated by heat. So typically the melting of a, uh, of a, a small linkage. So is a fusible link uh, sometimes described as a thermal link? Um, yeah, I think that might be the I, I, I suspect possibly a thermal link might be a slightly more expansive term because it perhaps might include um, electrical sensing devices that detect a temperature and then signal it, whereas a fusible link is just like a fused wire. It fails definitely yeah. once. But I, I, to be honest, I couldn't be 100% sure on that. Right. Now, just help us with this. What's your interpretation of what this note part um, says about whether an ES classified damper should be used if following this guidance to protect an escape route? Well, I don't think it says it should be used, it says it may be used. So it's offering an ES classified fire and smoke damper as an option for protecting escape routes. And what it's saying is definitely not an option is a fire damper with just a fusible link. Right. 
Can we agree then that this guidance seems to be silent at best on whether a fire damper without a fusible link is acceptable? So do you mean a fire damper that's actuated, for example, by a, um, a smoke detector? Yes. Um, I, think it, I think you could interpret that paragraph, and I think there's a very similar paragraph um, around about paragraph 1015, which, so, so I think you could interpret that to say that you can just have a fire damper, so an E-classified damper, with smoke detection. And, and is that something that you would recommend in, in a system which is protecting an escape route, that you could just have a fire damper, so only pr protecting integrity, not smoke leakage, so in, in, on, a, on an escape route? Sorry. So in most circumstances, um, your E and your ES rated dampers are quite similar in terms of scale and size. So if I had um, carte blanche, I would simply specify an, uh, an ES damper. Um, and but I have, you, sorry, can I? Would you be comfortable specifying simply a fire damper? So I've had to look at exactly that situation recently on some legacy buildings where they only had fire dampers that had been put in that were um, activated by smoke detection. Um, so we did some analyses and, and it was on a ventilation system to work out whether that was acceptable. So it may be acceptable in certain circumstances, but you have to do your analyses to work out whether that's okay. And would it be acceptable at Grenfell Tower? We know that the lobby escape route was an important escape route for residents mm -hmm. to get to the stair. Um, how could one logically conclude that you don't need the S part of the classification, the smoke leakage part, and that you only need integrity? How is that logical? So one of the problems with the approved document is it doesn't give us a specific um, specification for dampers that are used on mechanical smoke extract systems. In fact, it doesn't deal with mechanical smoke extract systems at all, really. It just references it out to other standards. So if I went to... Um, Let's say I went to EN 12101 Part 6, which is referenced from the approved document B. That says I can use a modified smoke control <coughs> damper, um, which is not a classified damper. And if I went somewhere else, like BS 9991, that would say that on a mechanical smoke extract system, I could use a damper that had um, a different smoke leakage characteristic to an ES damper. So there must be something special about mechanical extract systems that people think enables you to have a different smoke leakage characteristic for the dampers. And what, what is that? So I anticipate that the purpose behind that is that um, because you're, if you're extracting, then you're typically putting your shaft into a negative pressure. So if you do have any leakage, any additional leakage, um, you, it, leakage will tend to be towards the shaft and not back out onto another floor plate. Yes, and we'll come to see in a moment whether that was the case or not at Grenfell Tower. Um, but if ES fire smoke dampers or better were not, according to this guidance, required to be installed on escape routes, where would they need to be installed? I mean, where else would you put your ES fire and smoke dampers well, if, I don't not, think if not on an escape route? Sorry, I don't think the approved document nor the British standards tell us where you should or you shouldn't use something. They're saying it's an option that you could use in these circumstances. So I wouldn't expect to interpret that paragraph to tell me where I have to use an ES standard damper, it's an option that you could use to overcome the concern, which is because an ES classified damper, for example, cannot be operated just by a fusible link. Yes, well, let's have a look at BS um, 9991 now. Um, we've looked at this before in a different context. BSI 50621. Mm -hmm. Just to be clear, the ES damper in that application can't be just by a fusible link. Sorry. Um, this is Fire Safety and the Design, Management and Use of Residential Buildings Code of Practice. Go to page 117 of this. And at the bottom of the page, at 39, there's a, a heading, HVAC systems serving the whole building or interconnecting dwellings and other residential units. Do mm -hmm. you see that? I do, yeah. And it says, mechanical HVAC systems. So HVAC stands for? Uh, heating, ventilation and air conditioning, I think. Yeah. So... Such systems serving the whole building should be designed to prevent the spread of fire and smoke from the room of fire origin throughout the building. In particular, measures should be taken to ensure that air movement in the system prevents incursion of fire and combustion products into protected escape routes or allows lines of fire complementation to be breached. And then if we go 
to the next paragraph at the top of the next page, page 118. There's a, a heading, measures to aid firefighting controls should be incorporated, incorporated, including the following, and then D, where a ductwork system serves more than one part of a compartmented or fire-separated escape route, smoke detector-operated fire dampers should be provided where the ductwork enters each fire-separated or smoke-separated section of the escape route. And then this, where a fire damper is used to protect an escape route, it should be tested in accordance with BSEN 1366 Part 2 and an ES classification equal to or greater than 60 minutes in accordance with BSEN 13501 Part 3. Do you see that? I do see it, although when I read it, when you read it back to me there, I'm quite confused as to why they needed two sentences there. I don't know why they didn't just say, and it should be tested in accordance with BSEN 1366-2 and an ES classification. Why, why have they said where a fire damper is used to protect an escape route? Well, I'm curious, actually, why they've done yeah. that. I can't help you, but are we, no, sorry. can <laughs> we be clear that it's, where it, it's saying there in that second part, where a fire damper is used to protect an escape route, which is the case at Grenfell Tower, it, this piece of guidance is saying it should be tested in accordance with that standard and an ES classification equal to or greater than 60 minutes should be achieved. Yes, it is saying that, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, with the benefit of this wording in this British standard, and thinking back to the wording we looked at at 5.48 of ADB, do you agree that an ES classification ought to have been provided for a damper on an escape route? Well, again, I don't think that answers the question for us for a system like Grenfell Tower, because in this particular configuration, you'd expect an HVAC system to shut down <laughs> Um, and not be able to create the negative pressure that I think a mechanical system provides. There is a separate specific reference to mechanical ventilation systems in BS 991, if, I'm, if I recall correctly, which um, gives a, a different interpretation, particularly in the later version. So are you saying that because it's a mechanical system and you would expect negative pressure in the, in the, in the ducts, in the vents, that... Uh, potentially that was a justification for not having ES classification dampers. That appears to be an interpretation that's been applied both in later versions of this standard and other guidance like the SEA guide. And I can understand the logic behind that um, because we have different smoke protection requirements for the openings into protected shafts depending on the different exposure conditions. So. I think there's, there's definitely scope to be able to, to have a different standard. Um, quite why it was felt necessary to do that, I, I can't explain. I presume it's to do with testing standards, availability of equipment, all these sorts of questions. Yes. But, but somebody wrote a standard, and it was suitably authorised, um, that, that says these things. Let's assume for the moment that ES classification dampers possibly even um, smoke control dampers themselves, but certainly ES, fire and smoke dampers, were available for Grenfell Tower. Mm -hmm. Why would you not specify them for use on an escape route, given the importance of the lobby at Grenfell Tower? Um, I think if they were available um, and you could overcome all the constraints at Grenfell Tower, then I expect you would do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things that you, you notice, I mean, there's lots of problems with, well, there's... there's Issues of, of you have availability, you have different sizes, you have questions such as, I know Dr Lane's gone into this and, and I've, I've mentioned this, you have problems with things like actuators and how they interface with your dampers. But also when you have things like ES dampers, you have to worry a lot more about the installation of them because it's not just the damper itself that might leak, it could leak around the damper. So you often see extra things like patricing and such like around the dampers, which would be very difficult to achieve at Grenfell Tower because you'd have to work inside a very small shaft to try and install extra sealant effectively. Okay. So well, the application, so, so saying it's available doesn't just mean so you can buy one off the shelf. You have to be able to fit it yes, and I maintain it. I understand. Um, let's look at um, your report again now, LAY701 at page 199. And I want to look at paragraph 664 first. You say this, you say, um, I mean, you're talking here about the SCA guide at the mm -hmm. time. 
and this was the SCA guide 2012, you say, whilst the SCA guide includes a general suggestion that dampers should be smoke control dampers, it does not suggest that they need to be S classified smoke control dampers and provides alternative specification options which differ from the specific requirements for smoke control dampers tested to EN 12101 part eight and EN 1366 part 10. To satisfy the SCA guide specification criteria for dampers used in a smoke control system, the design would only need to meet the least onerous of the possible criteria set out in section 8.2.5 of the SCA guide. And then over the page, in some cases, this may only require the dampers to be fire dampers tested to BS 476 part 20. As noted in the previous paragraph, the Gilbert Series 54 dampers appear to be capable of meeting the BS 476 Part 20 criteria, but are not certified as so doing. Now, just to be clear, your opinion is that the Gilbert's dampers did not actually meet any of the SCA recommendations because they were not tested in accordance with any of the test procedures specified in the SCA guide. That's right, isn't it? <coughs> Um, if we're going to treat the wording in the SCA guide as prescriptive, um, it's a little bit tricky because they were tested to a standard, 1366 Part 2, but they modified the protocol of that standard so you couldn't be classified under that standard. Yes. They did measure smoke leakage during that test and they did check for um, integrity and um, uh, the the ability to resist spread of fire. It's, it's a bit of a weird one, really. Um, so there was a test. It wasn't fully to the correct standard. There is protocol within classification that allows you to still offer a classification under certain circumstances. But um, I don't think you could say in the strictness of the wording that it was actually tested to that standard because there was a variation. No. There was a modification. I think that's a long way of saying that you agree that these dampers were not tested to any of the standards identified in the Smoke Control Association guidance, were they? Correct, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, if sorry, sorry. I'm sorry if that was long-winded, but I wanted to, to be clear um, about the fact that you, you test things, you sometimes modify those tests because of the application you're going to use something in, and there's no point... I mean, it'd be very easy to test them things, say, oh, I've got a certification, I can use it in this application, but what if it's a slightly different application that the test wasn't applicable to? You might meet something that comes from statutory guidance that's intended for a different building type or a different building situation. But it doesn't mean to say that you've actually achieved what you should be achieving. So that's why I offered that clarification. Yes, I see. Uh, let's just have a quick look at the SCA guide, LFB 3059241. And I want to start at page 36. So it begins, this is automatic opening vent smoke control damper used for, for ventilation from corridor or lobby into smoke shaft or smoke control duct. And it says no formal product standard exists for the use of these products in this application. To ensure the necessary product performance is achieved, it is recommended that the AOV should be regarded as a smoke control damper and the relevant product standards should be considered. Um, but then it goes on, and if we go over the page... At 37, it says, if we pick it up second line down, it says there are several applicable smoke control damper standards, and these are listed below. So those are the, some of the smoke control damper standards we've looked mm -hmm. at. And then below that, it says this, any damper tested as fire resisting tests are made during the standard, using the standard time temperature curve, supported by an ad hoc operation test at elevated temperature, using a drive open, drive close actuator could also be acceptable, and these standards are listed below. And then right at the bottom, it says dampers tested in the closed position to BS 476 Part 20 could also be suitable. So um, can we just look now at, at ADB again, um, CLG 50224, page 88. And if we go back to paragraph 10.15, um, and note one in 10.15, we can see 
says this, fire dampers tested using ad hoc procedures based on BS 476 may only be appropriate for fan off situations. In all cases, fire dampers should be installed as tested. Do you see that? I do see that, yep. Now, do fan off situations refer to systems not involving a fan operating as part of the, the system? Um, my understanding of why that's there is because you could have two situations for the type of ductwork and scenario, ventilation ducts, et cetera, that's being discussed here. You could have a situation where you are extracting or a situation where you are pressurizing and blowing into a duct. Um, in one of those situations, you wouldn't want to use a 476 damper because um, you could be blowing smoke out of a leaky damper. Whether that would be the same for an extraction solution, I can understand why you might, somebody might make a case to say, actually, no, it's fine. But the ADB has gone for a blanket ban on that because in most ventilation systems, in some cases you're pushing, in some cases you're pulling. So I suspect that's probably what it's reflecting. Right. Can we agree that BS 476 Part 20 is a historical test standard from 1987 relating to testing fire resistance of elements of construction rather than dampers specifically? And it was superseded many years ago. Uh, yes, it was, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it didn't contain any smoke leakage requirements as opposed to restricting hot gases to prevent ignition, yes? Yes, it had effectively just an integrity um, requirement in, in this regard. So um, can you explain how the SCA guide has managed to recommend or permit the use of a damper tested to this very old standard uh, as acceptable for uh, a smoke control damper situation? Well, I imagine it's for the same reason the approved document in 2013 had BS 476 in it. It was a legacy standard that lots of products have been tested to. But it wasn't actually tested fully to that standard, was it? No, it wasn't. No, no. Okay. Um, but the, the test conditions it was exposed to, um, if you'd... Um, I'll, I'll be careful here because I'm, I'm not a testing engineer. I've, I've, I've witnessed lots of tests. I've, I've got some knowledge of this. But... I think I'm right in saying that if you basically change the wording on the front from um, BSEN 1366 Part 2 and wrote 476 across the top of it, you'd basically completed exactly the same test. Now, um, I just want to summarise uh, what's in Dr Lane's supplemental report. Uh, she... Are we going to a new topic? Um, no, it's, it's linked to this. If I could just finish this subtopic. Mm -hmm. I would be really grateful. Okay. I know this is a very technical, dry subject. Yes, go on. I apologise. It's horrific, um, isn't it, Dampers? I'm sorry, it so, really is. Uh, yes. In Dr Lane's supplemental report, page 128 and following, uh, what she has done is exhibited a number of emails that were exchanged uh, around the time that the SCA guide was being drafted in 2010, um, which shows that these alternative options for dampers in a smoke control situation were merely intended as a temporary course of action pending the formal publication of standards for smoke control dampers, which then occurred in 2011 with the publication of BSEN 1366 Part 10 and in 2011. However, these alternative routes were not then removed after the standards publication, uh, resulting in Dr Lane's view in a substantial reduction in the performance requirements uh, shown in the SCA guide. Now, first of all, is it right that the SCA guide 2020 has now removed all of those alternative routes, recommending only smoke-controlled dampers compliant with BSEN 12101 Part 8, 2011? I think it did, yes. Do you have a, 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 any view? Did you know that that was the backdrop to the SCA guide recommending those alternative options as a stopgap while the, the formal British standard was being developed? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I presume that's the case. I've, I've worked on numerous projects with various smoke control systems where people have complained they could not get hold of smoke control dampers um, which would suit their application, typically due to the size of the damper or a, a particular duct or opening they've got to fit it into. Um, and that's right up until, well, the, the last one I can remember was about four or well, three or four years ago. Um, so I know there was definitely a supply problem, and there's often a lag between someone introducing a standard and then suppliers being able to book tests to be able to test those products and then get them to market and make sure all the maintenance and spare parts are available. So you could be facing... I imagine from a, a standard being introduced to products being available in the market could be a good 18 months and then 
dampers come in lots of different sizes, so, you know. But did you know that those alternative provisions in the SCA guide were intended as a stopgap, a short-term stopgap in 2010, pending the publication in 2011 of formal smoke control damper standards? I didn't know that specifically, no. I've only um, understood that from the summary of that information that Dr Lane's presented. I've not, I'll be honest, there was thousands of pages of documents dropped in just tranche 245, I think it was. I've not had a chance to look at those. They only arrived very recently. Do you consider that in the light of that, the SCA guide contained appropriate guidance on the standard of design for dampers used on escape routes? Um, I think it included, a, it included a bare minimum option. It's, it's, not, it's not the standard I would like to use, but I can appreciate why they perhaps did it. Um, because there's probably no standards before that. Pe I think prior to that, people were basically just pegging it back to being equivalent to a, um, a smoke-sealed fire door, which is one of the options in, in a previous version of the SCA guide, and they wanted to move it forward. And I guess these things have to move forward in steps. You, you can't go from nothing to, to the full-on system, to the, to the full-on damper specification. I, I presume that's why it is, but I, I, I don't know the full background to it. But they're bare minimum standards, and those standards weren't met by these dampers, were they? Um, not specifically, no. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr Chairman, I think that's a good moment for our break. It is, is it? All right, thank you very much. Well, it's time we had a break, I think, uh, Mr Lay. <coughs> we'll stop there. We'll resume, please, at uh, quarter to four. And uh, again, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence while you're out of the room. All right, thank, thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much. Quarter to four, please.
Would you ask Mr. Lay to come back in, please? Right, Mr. Lay, on we go. Yes? Onward. Right. Yes, Ms. Yes, thank you. A few more questions on dampers, I'm afraid. Um, can we go to page 387 of your report? Um, LAY701, page 387, at paragraph 1217. Here, you, you say, whilst the dampers could not be classified as S-type dampers, they did have data on their leakage at a pressure differential of 300 pascals. In her report for phase two of the inquiry at figure 6.43, Dr Lane evaluated the leakage from the Gilbert series 454 dampers and at 6.5.76 concluded that the cumulative leakage of that damper type would be less than a damper classified as type S, which could have a constant leakage of 200 metres cubed per hour per metre squared. I also note that it was 74 minutes into the test that the damper leakage exceeded 360 metres cubed per hour per metre squared, the maximum leakage rate permitted for the basic specification of a smoke-controlled damper from EN 13501 Part 4. Now... In other words, I think what you're saying is the Gilbert's damper leaked at different rates at different points in the test, but the averaged leakage rate over the test period was under 200 cubic metres per hour per square metre. Is that right? Yes, yeah, yeah. And 200 cubic metres per hour per square metre is the maximum leakage permitted for an S-certified damper at any given point in the test period. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, can we agree that the maximum smoke leakage requirement for an S-certified damper is not expressed as some kind of cumulative or average number over the test period, but is about whether at any given point in the test period the 200 cubic metres per hour is exceeded? I would say for a, for a classification of type S, that's correct, yes. Yes, and taking a step back and thinking about a real-world application of this and bearing in mind life safety... We're concerned with a damper on a vertical shaft being used for a smoke control system which exit onto a, an escape route. When assessing whether that escape route would be safe for a resident to go through during any given minute, isn't the instant leakage rate more important than an average rate over a much longer period? Uh, not necessarily. It depends on the, the exposure condition um, because you've got... Um, fans running, etc., and, and, and stuff like that as well. So I'm not entirely sure the leakage rate is as critical as, as being suggested. But, you know, it, you, you are... Well, I suppose also the fire grows, so I, I don't think I can answer that question. It's a bit more complicated than that. Well, what I'm putting to you is that, in other words, if the damper leaks so much during a particular period of peak leakage that a particular resident can't safely get through the lobby, the fact that it may have leaked much less before or after is of scant comfort from the resident. Do you agree with that? Um, I suppose so, yeah, although... A little word of caution about that. I'm not entirely 100% sure about the test procedure that they used and whether or not the, um, the leakage rate that they determined is a function of the test procedure or whether it's a function of the actual damper itself. Because it was an ad hoc test procedure, I don't know whether the, the process they used might be responsible for getting a different value. Because it's quite a, it is a very sudden and sharp drop-off. Yeah. When, you, when you look at the graph, um, it is a very sudden change. So I do wonder whether it's actually a product of the test procedure, perhaps, rather than the damper's characteristics. OK. Let's turn to the test methodology behind that cumulative leakage rate for these Gilbert's dampers. If we go look at page 197 of your report, um, at paragraph 658, mm -hmm. and I want to pick it up four lines down... You say, in this test, the damper was in a closed position at the start of the test. This is not commensurate with the procedure set out in the test standard. This does, is not, this does not appear to have been a test intended to achieve an S classification, as no check on the leakage of the damper at ambient temperature prior to the fire test was carried out. Now, starting the damper from a, a closed position in the test would affect the reliability of the smoke leakage measured during the test. Can we agree that? It could do, yes. Yeah. yeah. And if we look uh, at Dr Lane's supplemental report, if we go to BLARP 2, 5043, at page 139, and we look at the top of the page, 
in figure 64 here what she's done is um, help as to what the relevant test conditions are in the two minute period that the damper is required to change position from open to closed if you're following the test methodology uh, properly mm-hmm. and if you look at, at box b uh, we can see that she's got the text there, elevated temperature material effects on damper ability to close tightly. The Gilbert's tested smoke evacuation ev- damp- damper ventilator was comprised of, first of all, a frame of 1.5 millimetre galvanised mild steel and damper blades 1 millimetre galvanised mild steel. And she explains that temperatures up to 445 degrees C, the strength of mild steel reduces up to minus 10%. The stiffness of it reduces up to minus 35%. And it expands by 0.5% for the 0.91 metre long blades tested by Gilberts. This is equivalent to an expansion of minus 5 millimetres. Do you see that? I think it might be approximately 5 millimetres, um, but... I can see that, yeah. But do you agree with those observations about what's likely to happen to the galvanised mild steel in the damper uh, during the time in the test where normally it's required to move from open to closed under elevated temperatures? So, first of all, I'm, I'm not a metallurgist, so I, I can't tell you whether those numbers are right. And, and But, you know, dampers are intended to... Um, so, well, some kinds, I guess in some cases they might be more leaky at ambient, in some cases they might be less leaky at ambient, depends how the damper's been designed. But certainly a damper that's made of steel, I would expect the damper manufacturer to be aware of the fact that it will heat up and that could change the um, uh, interaction of the different blades. Um, but exactly what that means for a particular damper, it, it could go either way, I think. Well, can we agree that any distorting of the damper blades due to increased temperatures before the pressure of the system is then applied to the blades is likely to weaken their resistance and make it more likely to leak smoke? Well, I don't think the strength reduction is particularly relevant here. I, I, I honestly don't think... I couldn't answer that. There's, there's so much complex um, fa- factors and features happening there you know, I'd expect the manufacturers designed it to take that sort of thing into account. Um, but I don't think you can do one number and say, yep, that would definitely be OK or not OK. When I mean, I've watched a lot of fire resistance tests, and one of the hardest things to do is to predict what's going to happen with metal elements in a fire resistance test. You often think that more robust things will sail through a fire resistance test, but actually, um, because they're fixed and they constrain all the forces, um, they buckle and they, and they fail but dampers are typically designed with that sort of thing in mind. So I, I wouldn't, I, well, I, I'm, I'm not a sufficient expert in fire resistance testing or metallurgy to make a claim that that has an effect. Yes, but one of the problems is we don't know, do we? Because the Gilbert's damper was uh, started in the closed position, so it never yeah. underwent this bit of the test, did it? I mean, it'd be more relevant if we had a figure for its leakage ambient. That's the, probably the more interesting number that would be useful to have. I just want to read out to you what Mr Jones of Gilbert said when he gave oral evidence. For the transcript, this is day 157, page 73, lines 17 to 23. When asked about the impact of starting from the closed rather than the open position, he said, it would have been more onerous to start it from the open position because of expansion of materials. Mm -hmm. If the damper was open for a period of time, then what would happen is the damper blade could swell, the frame could swell, etc. And then we'd have to watch out for more adjustments if you will of the damper product itself so that that was the evidence of um mr jones of gilbert's that that suggests doesn't it that actually the leakage is likely to be more if these dampers undergo the test procedure properly as it was intended to rather than starting from the closed position i I wouldn't like to infer exactly how the leakage would change Um, it could mean that the mechanisms might jam or something like that that may be what he's referring to but I honestly think it would be a mistake without doing a proper analysis and maybe having one tested to draw that sort of inference because it is a very complicated matter. There's lots of little bits of metal here all moving in different ways and I think it would be an error to to infer that. But Mr. I mean, Mr. Mr. Jones from Gilbert, it's his dampers, he's seen them tested. Maybe he knows that for a fact, I don't know. Let's look at another aspect of determining the damper's likely performance, namely operational reliability and durability. 
Now, Dr. Lane has explained in her report that the method for testing smoke control dampers is different to that from fire dampers and fire and smoke dampers. And the key differences are that the number of open and closed cycles, i.e. the durability of operational reliability, requires 10,200 cycles for a smoke control damper prior to fire testing versus just 50 open closed cycles for fire dampers and fire and smoke dampers. And as we've seen, the testing um, of the ability to, of the dampers to change from open to the closed position and vice versa is tested at elevated temperatures in the tests. Now, as for these open closed cycles requirement, since the dampers were part of an environmental ventilation system at Grenfell Tower, can we agree that they were reasonably expected to open and close potentially many times in a week? Yes. And can we agree that being tested for over 10,000 cycles, smoke controlled dampers are therefore shown to be effective after a much longer operational lifetime and as part of a multi-component system? Um, I don't know if it's tested for a longer operational lifetime, and, and I don't know whether they, there's a suggestion of perhaps changing the service interval or the inspection interval because of that presumed more resilience. Um, but I'm not sure it necessarily tells you anything. If, you, if you're regularly inspecting and maintaining your dampers, I'm not sure it matters that much. So you don't think it matters that much to test them for over 10,000 opening closed cycles as per the smoke control? I, I'm not an expert on damper testing to that level, of that, to that degree, to be able to say why they put that into the standard. But there must be a reason why they put it into the standard, mustn't there? Well, I presume there's a reason for it, but I wouldn't be able to say what that reason is. I didn't write the standard. I see. Now, um, is it your view that the smoke control system designer is entitled to assume when designing the system and specifying the dampers that the shafts will remain depressurised during a fire through the correct operation of the fans? I think that is a presumption that's made, yes. Right. And you also refer to the stack effect present potentially compensating for any failure of a fan to start. And you say that in your report, this is paragraph 494, page 154, that uh, that could possibly be as much as 70% of the overall system effect could be from the stack effect. Is so that in, correct? in some system types, yes. I think I'm referring there to different system types, aren't I? Um, and I'm talking about um, the different... Uh, yeah, there's different types of system, um, but certainly in systems that use shafts and mechanical shafts, a significant effect can be from the natural stack effect, yes. Yeah. Do you agree that these systems are notoriously prone to fault and quite often don't work as expected when, when tested? I would say that uh, mechanical, um, certain types of mechanical smoke control system um, have a different reliability to others, but I would say that there is a potential for a reliability issue if you don't maintain them properly. Right. Should the immediate consequence of fan failure in those circumstances have been specifically considered when selecting the damper? So not to assume that the, the vents would always be depressurised because the fans are working, <laughs> but perhaps to assume that there could be a fan failure for whatever reason, and thereby take that into account when selecting the dampers. Um, I, th I think that would be best practice. Um, I don't think it's necessarily standard that everybody does that. Um, and it's very difficult to do that because the computational modelling methods that are used, um, it's quite tricky to model things like damper leakage. It's only really a very recent thing that you've been able to do that. So at the time, I don't think it's something I would have expected someone to do. Right. Um, but I would say things have moved on and we, we might well do that sort of thing now, um, even if you're using a smoke control damper. Dr Lane has, has pointed out that some of the British standards, including BSEN 12101 Part 8 2011 on smoke and heat control systems, specifically uh, warn about the risks of fans not extracting enough air, leading to smoke leaking back through, excessively through the dampers. Do you agree that that's a risk that designers ought to be aware of? Um, I'm not sure it's... Well, uh, well, I'll be perfectly honest, I can't recall whether that's a standard that's relevant to this type of system, particularly. Um, the EN12101 covers a wide range of different smoke control system types. Um, I'd have to look at the standard and read it to give you an honest answer, sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, 
Let's look at the table of airflow speeds um, that were taken by Mr Partlow and sent to Mr Hansen of Building Control as part of the commissioning of the Grenfell system. This is at RBK 403784. Sorry, actually, that, that's, the, that's the original version of them. Let's look at Dr. Lane's annotations on this. Uh, it's at uh, page 143 of Dr. Lane's supplemental report, BLARP 2-5043. Yes, so there's that table in the middle of the page. Mm -hmm. And what Dr. Lane has done is put some um, borders around certain numbers. Now, this is a low grill, so it's south grill, low speed, we can see that the numbers in red indicate a negative airflow, i.e. the airflow was going from the shaft into the lobby, and those in orange indicate no airflow in either direction, they're naught. Now, in her report, Dr Lane notes that the negative airflow was recorded across 12 floors and zero readings on four floors at this low grill when the flam was at low speed. Now, do you agree with that interpretation of the data for the south shaft? Well, it's just a statement of fact. That's, that's the data as it's presented, yeah. Yeah. And do you agree that this might mean that the system wasn't, in fact, depressurising the south shaft and that, in fact, there was positive pressure going from the shaft back into the lobby? Well, it's in the low-speed mode, so it's not trying to depressurise the shaft in that particular mode. Um, but it shouldn't be there shouldn't be a positive pressure from the shaft back in there because the fan is at low speed, surely? Yeah, but the fan is also pulling against the stack effect of the building. So these commissioning data was taken in, what, sort of March, February, March time? So the air outside would have been cold and the air inside the building would have been warm, so you would have had the maximum stack effect pulling against it, um, which would have been very different compared to something that happens in, in June or something like that. So... Um, I, I don't think it's necessarily a particular concern. What, what it doesn't tell me is what's happening on other floors when, for example, um, so if we look at floor 12, when they tested floor 12 in low speed mode, they saw some flow out of the south shaft in low speed mode. That doesn't tell me that there would also be a flow out of the shaft on level 20 when you operate the system on level 12. These are individual data for individual floors. So I think Dr Lane suggests that you can infer data for the whole building from each of these within her report, and I think that's wrong. But if it's not overcoming the stack effect for the south shaft, even at low speed, that's the system not operating as it was intended to, is it? Um, I'm not sure what the system was intended to do at low speed, apart from... Um, create a little bit of background ventilation, I, I infer that, a little bit of background clearance, and to not um, make the doors, the pressure at the doors and the force at the doors so you can open the doors. It didn't have a particular defined functional role at low speed. Unless I'm missing something, did I? I see. I mean, you, you say in your latest statement that this might mean that the system was acting in a smoke clearance capacity, I pushing out... Um, the smoke, um, but, but how is that acceptable given that that was not how it was designed to work? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's not its designed for condition, which is to try to deal with the, the larger flows when the door is open. But so if you take, um, let's look at level 12 again, for example, that says in low speed, we are seeing 2.1 meters per second flowing into the north shaft and 0 0.9 meters per second flowing out of the south shaft. So that suggests that even with everything else closed, you're actually getting a little flow through the shaft through, or through the lobby, which would be beneficial. That's a yeah. good thing. Yes, I, I realise you're trying to put some positive... Um, well, I'm quoting the data. Sorry, I'm not trying to put a positive spin on anything. I'm telling you what this data that Dr Lane is relying upon says. Well, with respect, Mr Lay, if this system had been working as intended, we shouldn't see negative figures there, should we? I don't know because I don't know what the intention in the south shaft <coughs> was. In well, the low speed mode. I'm sorry. sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Had you finished? Yes, sorry, yes. Um, I'm a little puzzled because um, 
I'd understood the system to be designed in such a way that unless and until the stair door was opened, the fans would be running at fairly low speeds. Is that right? That's correct, yes. So um, is the, are, are these figures for the airflow at low speeds indicative of what would be happening if the stair door were closed? I think they are, yes. Yes. So at that point, the south shaft, which ought to be sucking smoke out of the lobby, is not doing its job. So when the door, when the stair door is closed, yeah. the south shaft and the north shaft are running at a low speed. Yeah, but they're both designed to remove smoke, aren't they? They are, but they're designed to remove smoke when they're running at high speed. So what I think we're seeing here, I, you, you mentioned the paragraph just now where I talk about the fact that there's a... Um, a natural stack effect in these systems. Yeah. I think what you're seeing here, I suspect, is actually that natural stack effect occurring. Right. So what's happening is that if you turn the fans off completely, so you turned it back into something more akin to the original yeah. um, system, you would have a, effectively a chimney attached to an inlet. And if the air is warm inside the building and the air is cold outside, then you will naturally get a flow pulling up that shaft. Yeah. And right. that flow can be quite strong. What I suspect is happening is that in low speed mode, the fan isn't strong enough in the south shaft to pull against that stack effect, and therefore air is flowing through the lobby still and going out through the north shaft. You notice on the lower floors, the velocity coming out, um, it becomes a, a velocity flow back into the shaft, mm -hmm. and that's because those floors, of course, are um, situated in, in a different way compared to where the fans are, and I think that probably has a has an effect. So that's that's, you know, just pulling two and two together and using my my experience in the fluid dynamics. That I think is what you're seeing here, but it wasn't a a stated design condition apart from to avoid having too much flow out of the lobby, so that you stop the door from being opened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very is much. That helpful? Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you. Now, um, just rounding off on, on the topic of, of, of dampers, um, it's right, isn't it, that none of the revisions of PSB's technical submissions uh, prescribed a leakage performance to be achieved by the dampers installed in, their, in, in the system, did they? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. They just specified a product, namely the Gilbert's, uh, Gilbert's Series 54 dampers. Yes, yes. yeah. Um, Dr. Lane's uh, supplemental report refers to th these types of dampers as ventilators, and they had the lowest performance standard in the event of a fire, and she contrasts them with a certified smoke control damper, which is on the other end of the scale in terms of onerousness of requirements and complexity of function. Do you agree that with that s summary of the spectrum of what we see here? I'll, I'll be honest, I got quite lost reading that part of Dr. Lane's report. I'm not quite sure she appears to be hanging a lot on the fact that one of the witnesses used the term ventilator, although he used the term shaft ventilator. Um, she says that it doesn't apply to the approved document B, but the approved document B, if you look up automatic opening vents at the back of the index, it, 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 that's how it refers to these things. I, I found, honestly found it very confusing. I'm not quite sure I could say I agree or disagree with Dr. Lane in that section because I'm not quite sure what the intention of it was. Mr. Marnie's evidence was that smoke control dampers weren't used because none were available on the market at the time and because the dimensions and size wouldn't work with the size and position of the shaft. Now, um, in Dr. Lane, in her addenda and errata, dated the 30th of May 2022, if we can go to that, BLARP 25044, if we could go to that... On page three in section 1.1.1, page three. Yes, sorry. Um, if we go to 1.1.11 here on this page, mm -hmm. basically what she's done is she's done a, a search of the internet to see what products were available at the time 
the, the dampers were being specified by PSB. And what she says at 1.1.11 is, from this limited activity, I've found that two smoke-controlled dampers and two fire and smoke dampers were available in June 2015. And she summarises the criteria for her search of products on the following page at 1.1.19 on page 4. She says there that the, the criteria that she used to conclude they were suitable at Grenfell Tower were that if the product achieved at least a fire and smoke performance of ES60, it was stated as suitable for use in a concrete or masonry wall and was available in the dimensions that would fit the existing openings of the north and south shafts. Now, and then the results of Dr. Lane's limited search are summarised on page 5, table 1.1, and there we can see that she's identified <laughs> two smoke control dampers and two fire and smoke dampers. She's given the product specifications and references to the archive product data sheets. Now, um, have you had an opportunity to review those product sheets? No, I haven't. Um, I, I very briefly looked at this. It, it came in very, very late. Um, I'm sorry, but uh, it, there's a huge amount of information that we'd have to go through to determine whether this was, was relevant. Did uh, you do your own search to check whether Mr Marnie uh, was right that there weren't smoke control dampers or fire and smoke dampers available and suitable for Grenfell Tower at the time? Did you do your own equivalent search? Well, I'm not sufficiently experienced in the final selection of mechanical components to decide, first of all, what is or isn't appropriate because you have to worry about lots of things, not just the dimension of the whole, but um, no, I didn't. I, I've, so my experience, I think I mentioned this earlier, is that there certainly are issues with getting the right dampers um, in the marketplace and have been for some time. Um, so what he said in his, his statement did accord with, with my personal experience and what I've heard from many other mechanical engineers. Um, and I think Dr. Lane herself, for her previous report, did a search for equipment and spoke to her colleagues and hadn't managed to find something at the time. Um, it's only really last week that she managed to find something. Okay. Yeah. Well, and I don't know whether you, these you were available. You can't take this any further then. Sorry. Well, I mean, I had a brief look at them. Um, all of the smoke control dampers, um, just from the pictures on the front of the brochures, they've all got very large surrounds. So fitting those into those holes would have made the size of the opening very, very small. Um, they've all got large boxes on the outside of them that have the actuator in them. So you'd have to have them sticking out of the wall. Um, and to reference Dr. Lane's preferred standard, the approved document be it 10.11, fire dampers are supposed to be installed within the fire resisting element, not sticking out of the wall. So, you know, setting aside the fact that I'm pretty sure the residents at Grenfell Tower would have been rather upset if they'd had dampers sticking out at roughly head height right in front of their front doors. Um, and I don't think it was practical insulation. So I think Mr. Marnie made that point. So I just had a brief look to see whether it matched his evidence, and I think it does. And I did notice... Right, but you haven't done a, a detailed analysis of the measurements and the measurements at Grenfell Tower to check whether or not she's right that you could have installed these dampers in the wall there? No, no. But I don't think, um, from what I could see, there were other <laughs> issues. Um, for example, I think was the BSB damper or the Action Air one of those needed installation from effectively both sides of the wall? which you wouldn't have been able to do at Grenfell Tower because you can only access from the lobbies. So that would have been a very significant consideration, I suspect, in selecting dampers. I see. Mm. And could you not have um, taken the plane of the dampers outwards, if necessary? Sorry, I think I've just mentioned that. I don't think you could. Um, so the approved document B says you're supposed to fit dampers in the fire-resisting element. It's in 10.11. It's on the same page as 10.15 that we were looking at earlier. Um, and I'm not sure whether you have it sticking out of the wall, whether that's an actual tested condition, so you'd be using a damper outside its certified application, so that would be a breach of another part of the approved document B and also the, the standards. Um, and it, these dampers, I mean, the Mandic ones, they're probably, these things tend to be 600, 800 millimetre deep, which means it would have been sticking out of the wall right in front of residents, and they would have had to negotiate those. And the ones at low level you would have created a bit of a labyrinth for people to get to their, right. their flats. I think, you know, 
I guess you could have considered that, but by the time you've boxed it all in to make it look nice and not look like a warehouse, um, you'd have lost even more. I, I doubt that's something that residents would have would have wanted. Well, we had boxing in of gas pipe work all the way through the lobbies, didn't we? Yeah, we did, but it's not as obstructive um, and wouldn't be in a lo- wasn't in a location that I don't think that was would have been obstructive like these dampers were. I see. Um, commissioning and approval, very briefly now, because we're, we're running out of time. Sure. Um, you say in your report, this is paragraph 38 at page 20, that the commissioning and handover documentation was not to the standard that you would like to see. However, this does not mean that the commissioning was in itself inadequate or that a proper handover did not take place. Now, in your opinion, did the commissioning and handover of the system... Uh, satisfy the standards reasonably to be expected of competent system designers and commissioners? As far as I can tell from Mr Partlow's statement, yes. <coughs> so even though we know the cause and effect matrix was deficient, I think you've agreed with that, and that many of the tests that ought to have been carried out simply weren't documented, and all we have is Mr Partlow's oral evidence suggesting he did carry out those tests. So I think the... Defic- you're, sorry, you're oh, sorry. suggesting that that satisfied... Uh, reasonable standards are you sorry just go back through those points again um so the cause and effect concern is the fact that the environmental mode wasn't fully represented on the cause and effect well i think there were other cause and effect uh items that should have been there like the operation of the fireman's override switches um although they were cited within the commissioning test so so we we know it was carried out because this commissioning certificate says they were all checked and mr partler says they were all checked and he also, I think, described that that was how he sometimes operated the system on different floors. So, I, I, yeah, I totally agree the documentation. Documentation to me is more like a sign-off sheet than a full commissioning pack. Um, but admittedly, my standards for commissioning documentation come from a, a nuclear power plant, so they're slightly different to, to this. I see. So even though the documentation falls below the standard you would like to see, you, you don't think that overall the commissioning process did? I, I don't have any evidence that says it, it, it wasn't adequate, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm going to turn briefly now to just a few questions about uh, what happened on the night of the fire. And uh, before I get to that, I want to make it clear that since this is primarily a factual matter, mm-hmm. did the system work on the night? What's the evidence to suggest it did or didn't work? That it's ultimately going to be a question for the chairman and the panel to decide that. And you're not a forensic fire investigator, are you? I'm not. I did do a forensic fire course, but it was some time ago. So is it fair to say that all you can do in your evidence, and the same would apply to Dr Lane, is draw certain factual matters to the attention of the panel and provide a non-expert opinion about what that might tell the panel about what occurred on the night? Um, Yes, yeah, And, and using my understanding of smoke control systems and fluid dynamics as part of that, yes. Yes. Now, um, there's a disagreement between you and Dr Lane about um, the uh, time period during which you would expect this system to have operated. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Uh, There appears to be, yes. Yes. So if we look at uh, Dr Lane's supplemental report, BLARP 25043, and we look at page 13... At paragraph 1.3.44. So Dr. Lane has summarised the um, extent of agreement and disagreement at the top of that page. And she says, We agree that the design condition for a smoke ventilation system in a high rise residential building is a single story, single flat fire with smoke production causing smoke ingress in a single lobby. We are not in agreement as to when this single lobby condition is exceeded. Mr. Lay does not agree it is when smoke enters a second lobby, preferring instead there being a fire in another flat. So um, is is it fair to say that that you determine the end of that that period to be uh, when the fire hit level five, and we have fires in, in flats at level five, but Dr. Lane has determined that the end of that period is instead when there is actually smoke in a second lobby, say at lobby number five. So I I disagree with what Dr Lane has written there. Um, I don't say that um, the the end of the design for condition is when fire spread between levels. Um, But I'd also disagree with the opening sentence of Dr Lane's statement there as well, because um, there's nothing in any standard or guidance that says 
the design condition is breached when smoke propagation causes smoke ingress in a single lobby. Um, the design condition is a single fire um, in a flat that's expected to be contained to that flat um, or in the immediate vicinity of that flat, I think is probably the, the correct wording of it when you put all that together. Um, I think Dr Lane has extended that into smoke production. I don't necessarily agree, disagree with Dr Lane that it's appropriate to extend that. Um, and, um, but what I was more concerned about when I did my analysis is, first of all, what's the minimum time you could have used? Um, and that's when you do have fire spread between floors. And that appears to occur at 0107 or thereabouts, um, much earlier than Dr Lane has put into her report, which is, is a matter for, for the panel to decide what the evidence says on that. But I used the figures from, from the chairman's um, phase one report for that. I then considered what factors um, might influence the action of the smoke control system. And the primary thing that might change that was the action of firefighters. And certainly I felt that by 0120, the firefighting condition had changed. The firefighters had been deployed to multiple floors. They were laying hoses. They were opening doors on multiple floors from 0120 onwards. Um, and that fundamentally changes it. Whether smoke got into different levels or not, um, well, it was, by the way, um, during those firefighting operations, it's reported by firefighters and residents that there was smoke in other lobbies, but they were certainly opening the doors, um, and that could have changed the operation of the system or what it was expected to do. I see. Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Now, um, the Level 11 North dampers, I want to ask you briefly about this now. Mm -hmm. um, at page 17 of this report, Dr Lane identifies another area of disagreement with you. And she says at one, if we go to page 17, at 1.4.53, she says, um, we disagree that there was likely a breach of compartmentation by the north shaft level 11 dampers on the night of the fire. And then um, if we look at your report, if we could go to page 401 of your report, paragraph 1270. Mm -hmm. You say this, you say, at the north shaft on level 11, the BRE found no visible evidence of dampers being closed during part of the fire. This is not evidence that the dampers were not closed at the start of the fire, simply that the visual evidence of closure is absent. As noted above, the level of contamination that could occur at dampers will vary. The BRE noted that the evidence for the south dampers being closed was limited and variations in surface coloration were slight. As the north dampers would generally be within a region of greater smoke contamination than the south dampers, as the north dampers were located high at high level within the lobby, then if evidence on the south dampers was slight, it may not be surprising that evidence on the north dampers would be further limited. So that's what you say about this. And can we just look at what the BRE report said about it? If we go to MET 3039807. And I want to look at pa page 112 of this. So this is the BRE's Grenfell Tower Fire Investigation on-site investigation report. And if we look at, at paragraphs 153 downwards, here they're dealing with level 11. They say at 153, inspection of the low level dampers found that the metal surface on the edge of the blade tips, where the blades normally contact each other when in the closed position, was noticeably cleaner and had less smoke soot residue than the rest of the blade surface. The transition between this area and the rest of the blade surface was also marked by a very clearly visible line. In BRE's opinion, a likely explanation from this was that both of the lower dampers were closed during part of the fire. So that's the south dampers. They're saying there's this noticeably cleaner mm -hmm. and less uh, soot uh, residue on the blade tips, yes, which might suggest that they were closed during part of the fire and yeah. then opened. Mm -hmm. That's the south side dampers. And then, still dealing with the south side dampers, they say examination of the inside edge of the damper frame, see figure 107, showed a slight variation in surface coloration, but it was not sufficiently clear to indicate whether the dampers might have been closed during part of the fire. So looking at the inside edge of the damper frame, 
there was a slight variation in surface coloration, but that wasn't sufficiently clear on the south dampers, yes? Yes, yeah. Then if you go to the north dampers, it's at 155 below. They say inspection of the high-level dampers showed that the contact points on the damper blade tips were uniformly coated in smoke, smoke and soot. Therefore, unlike the low-level dampers, there was no visual evidence for the high-level dampers being closed during part of the fire. So the BRE have distinguished uh, in the, the soot markings that they can see as between the south dampers and the north dampers, yes? Yes. And that might suggest, based on that evidence alone, that the north dampers were open because there was uniform coating in soot and smoke, whereas the south dampers have got this distinct line on the edges of them and might suggest they were closed, yes? It would suggest that, uh, well, and sorry, the south, the south dampers were found closed, so we, so what you just said there is, and the north dampers were found open. So um, what I'm trying to express in that paragraph that I wrote, a little bit clumsily, I suppose, is that obviously when the south damper closed, um, you'd expect there to have been some sort of delineation um, between the, um, uh, the area that's covered by the closed damper and the area that isn't covered, and that was quite slight. So that suggests there must have been a fair amount of smoke contamination happening in, in that area. Then when you look at the north damper, um, there is no differentiation, and that damper was found open, I believe, at the end of the fire. Was it found open at the end of the fire? Well, or just damper? check. I think that both um, the dampers were found open at level 11. I can't recall, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. But I'm not sure it's right yeah. to say that the south Sorry. dampers okay. were found closed. But what I'm saying is that there was obviously a lot of smoke contamination happening um, to these dampers, and I expect there would probably be slightly more smoke contamination happening to the, to the north dampers, um, and depending on how long they were both open or closed for. Um, but what I'm concerned about is that just because there's a lot of smoke contamination on, on an open damper that's found open at the end of the fire um, doesn't really tell me exactly when it opened in the fire history. And, you know, this fire lasted for an extraordinarily long period of time, and there could have been a, a very long exposure condition here. Um, so I can't really say from that whether it was open at the start of the fire or not, yeah. because that evidence could have easily been obliterated by a long duration of exposure. Yeah. But it's right, isn't it, that for all the dampers found open by the BRE after the fire, including some open at level 18, the BRE concluded that the damper was probably closed during part of the fire based on soot deposits, lighter deposits on the blade tips and the frames. Mm. But the only exception to that that's drawn in the BRE report is the north shaft level 11 dampers, where they've referred to a, a different smoke soot pattern. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, because it's factually different, yes. So yeah. they, would, they have drawn attention to it, yeah. If we look at Dr Lane's supplemental report, BLARP 25043 page 192 at figure um, 8.3 she's mm -hmm. provided a post-fire photograph of the level 11 lobby in figure 8.3 below mm -hmm. we can make that as big as possible and you can see she's marked up the low the low level south shafts in blue and the high mm -hmm. level shafts in orange dr lane makes the point that um this seems to show soot staining from ceiling to ground level throughout and no evidence of this region of greater smoke contamination that might affect the north shaft dampers more than the south shaft dampers. Can, can you just help us? Where have you got that from, that there's this level of greater smoke contamination that's likely to have affected the higher dampers than the, the, the lower ones? So we know on some of the levels we saw that the north dampers were more heavily contaminated than the south dampers. On other levels, we definitely saw that. And are you saying that was the case for level 11? Sorry, I'll just complete what I'm saying. Um, what I'm saying here is, just because I can't see now a differentiation doesn't mean to say a differentiation didn't occur during the fire. Um, if there was a hot flowing layer and there was a lot of turbulence, I'd expect everything to be coated, but during the fire, it could well have been a hotter flowing layer at the top. There's just not enough information to in this photograph to say it definitely didn't happen, or it definitely did happen. All we're seeing here is a photograph after a, a very long, sustained and extreme fire exposure. Right. So I'd expect the whole thing to be covered, but it doesn't tell me what happened during that fire exposure. 
Now, the other evidence that you draw attention to in your report about what happened on Level 11 is the movements of the Jafari family and other witnesses mm. in terms of uh, the conclusions you draw about uh, whether, there were, whether there's evidence to suggest that these north dampers might have been open earlier in the fire. Now, can I just clarify one factual point? It, it, it will be a matter of, of um, matter for the panel to decide as a matter of fact whether... Um, your version of the facts is, is the version that they prefer, um, or indeed whether the panel wants to go this far at all. But I just want to clarify one thing that we're slightly puzzled by in your report. Um, if we go to your errata sheet, this is at LAY 702 at page 3, No, that's, yeah, seven zeros, two at page three. Yeah, here you, you've corrected what you've said about the Jafari family's movements. Mm -hmm. And you've corrected, um, the corrected paragraph is at the bottom of this page. And um, I just want to ask you about a line in this, um, in that you say... Um, You say, I've considered in more detail the likely timeline of events at level 11 to determine if there's any evidence that the north dampers might have been open early in the fire, which may have been evidenced by significant smoke leakage to that level. As far as can be ascertained, Maria and Fatima Jafari exited flat 86 on level 11 at 019 as they exited the building at 0122, having called the lift, and then after a brief wait, used the lift to descend directly to ground. Maria left her sister and father in the flat, expecting them to follow, and according to Nadia Jafari, the flat door would stay open if it was not locked. Then you say this, Maria Jafari and Mr. Jafari had a more complex journey, which sadly resulted in Mr. Jafari losing his life. Now, we think there's an error there in that you're, you're referring to Maria Jafari, but you should be referring to Nadia Jafari and Mr. Jafari had a more complex journey. I, I agree, yes. That's, sorry, that's my mistake, yeah. That's fine. And the other thing we wanted to clarify with you is... Uh, on what basis do you say that Maria Jafari is likely to have left the door open? Because we've, we've checked the witness statement of Maria Jafari and we can't see that she says that she left the door open when she and her mother left. Nadia Jafari does say that the, the door may have been open, but not Maria Jafari. And we want, to, hmm. we want you to clarify where you got that from. So I, I, I took it from Nadia Jafari saying that, but also my understanding of putting it all together and, and trying to be succinct um, without missing out in, any details for, um, for, for the family was that um, Maria and um, her mother, they left early, but there was an expectation that their father and Nadia were going to come as well. And they knew that the only way of closing their door, I believe, was to lock it. And I seem to recall either Nadia, I think Nadia went back to get Mr. Jafari's keys um, at one point. So I put that together and thought, well, if, my, if I've left behind my elderly father and my sister who've had an operation, would I lock them into the flat to close the door or not? And I think I surmised that I probably wouldn't have done that. Um, and I put that together with Nadia Jafari's evidence that she, um, that she thought the flat door may have been left open as well. Right, so, so it's yeah. an assumption you've made that Maria Jafari may not have closed the door behind her. Yeah, but based upon the fact that I, th I believe, I can't remember, I think it's one of the sisters says you had to lock the door to be able to properly close it. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, um, if the north dampers on level 11 had been open, just assume that for the moment, factually, mm -hmm. if they'd been open, what difference would that have made to the system's performance on the night in your view um difficult to know because you'd need to have a flow path um from so so if if, if it tried to draw air from the um north dampers um on level 11 it would come against resistance from the doors that are closed um interior doors that were closed i think particularly Nadia jafari is quite clear that when she saw the fire in the kitchen, she closed the door. So I don't think there's any evidence there's any doorways that were open to the lobby. 
So you would have come up against the resistance pathways that are quite significant. So it may not have made a huge amount of difference to the extraction at level four that was that was quite a significant extraction. Difficult to know. I'd have to do the calculations, um, but you'd have to make quite a lot of presumptions to do that sort of calculation. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if it was open and we were worried about damper leakage, then you would expect to see smoke coming out of it. I think that's Dr. Lane's presumption is that smoke did come out of the level 11 dampers and it came out of those dampers before anybody could have left a door open. And I don't think the timeline suggests that. Even the corrected timeline that Dr. Lane has issued doesn't seem to suggest that. Right, okay. Now, in terms of- I'm sorry, before we go on, just, just um, help me understand the mechanics of this. Um, if if um, dampers are open on a higher floor and the fans are running, uh, isn't the airflow going to be from the lobby into the shaft? Um, there would be some airflow from the lobby into the shaft, but exactly how much can be achieved will depend on the flow resistance pathway. And if all the doors on that lobby are shut, that will be quite a high resistance pathway um, compared to if it's, for example, if the fire... If the, if the door is open to the staircase on level four, for example. That I understand. Yeah. It's just the mechanics of how the smoke leaks back into the lobby from the shaft where it ought to be drawn up the shaft. Yeah, it, it shouldn't. So the fans are running. Um, I guess if you've got um, a big opening, I suppose the damper might be a big enough opening, then as air is sort of flowing past the damper, you'll get a bit of turbulence, and that could spill a little bit of smoke in because whenever you've got sort of smoke going yeah. past and, and, and clean air next to it, you will get a little bit of mixing. Um, so I guess you could have had a small amount there, but not to the level that Dr. Lane suggests, I think, was what witnesses that, that she was relying upon. So, mm -hmm. yeah. You, you, you know, I mean, that might explain, for example, a smell or a very light quantity of smoke. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Chairman, I'm conscious of the time and yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my questions and trying to pair them right back. I think I'm going to need to be another five minutes, if that's okay. Well, five minutes I'm sure would be all right. We take all the support staff for granted rather when we do this, but um, I think that's all right. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, another topic you, you deal with in your report is uh, whether there were breaches of compartmentation and damper leakage. Uh, shown by the evidence, and you discussed the evidence of Farhad Neda on level mm -hmm. 23, who gave evidence at phase one of this inquiry about having seen smoke leaking into level 23 from the north and the south mm. shafts. And you essentially say, I can't really reconcile that evidence with how the system was supposed to work. Is that fair? Yes, that's fair, yes. Yeah. Now, again, let's assume Mr Neda was right. I know mm. you've pointed out that there might have been other pathways for smoke to enter that lobby but let's assume he was right and he could clearly see smoke entering the lobby at level 23 from the north and the south shafts and filling up as mm -hmm. he described what does that tell us about the system performance in terms of its compartmentation at level 23 um, at that point in the fire so it would be just before 1.30 so um, I mean I, I anticipate the dampers might have been on the south shaft, expect them to be cold, a bit warmer on the north side perhaps, so that would affect the leakage rates. Um, you'd have to, I'd expect the fan would have to be off um, to see that kind of effect, both fans. So you'd only expect to see that if the fan was off? Yes, yeah. W what about, for example, if the south fan was undersized and simply wasn't counterbalancing the stack effect? What about the fact that there could have been smoke accumulating in that south shaft? Is that not a possibility? Um, well, the smoke has got to... So if it's coming from level four, which it would have been at that point in time, um, it's got to be at low level in level four and then get into that shaft and then come up the building and, and fill it up. Um, the impression I get from, I think, the BRE evidence about the staining at level four of the dampers... Um, is that there wasn't a huge amount of smoke exposure onto those dampers. Um, now, there's lots of things to take into account there, like firefighting water and the such like, that could have changed that evidence as well. So if that shaft had been able to fill with smoke, um, and because you have dampers and all dampers leak, then I guess stack effect could have meant that you could have seen some smoke coming out from the south shaft, yeah. It's possible. Mm. And what about the north side? 
Well, you definitely need the fans to be off, I think, on the north side for that to happen yeah. um, because you're very close to the fans at that point. Yeah, so you would Obviously, expect the draw to be strongest at level 23? Uh, you would expect it to be strongest at level 23, that's right, yeah. Right. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then um, you've also addressed at some length in your report and in your statement the conclusions you draw about evidence of some firefighters, including firefighter Moore, about what was seen outside the tower during the fire, and you've drawn attention to Firefighter Moore's evidence that he may have seen smoke being extracted from the second floor vents at around 3.30 in the morning, yes? Yes. Now, again, it's going to be a matter for the chairman and the panel to determine what conclusions they draw from that evidence, but can you just help us with this? Have you attended the tower and looked for yourself at what view Firefighter Moore would have had of the second floor vents, given the position he said he was standing in? Um, I don't know the precise position he was standing in. I think he said he was standing just under the shelter of the walkway. I think he was acting as the safety officer, if I remember rightly, so he had to make sure he had a good view. I don't think he's given us on a plan exactly where he was, where he was stood. But um, I think standing under the walkway, looking up, I'm pretty sure you can see most of the tower. And I think in... Dr Lane's recent um, tranche of evidence that arrived on the 30th of May, there was a video that was taken from someone stood on the edge of the walkway because the part of the video is obscured by the walkway above, and that shows a clear view up the side of the tower. Um, but I think yeah, the walkway was quite high, wasn't it? It, was, it wasn't just a shallow walkway, it was quite high up. And I think anyone stood under the walkway would have a pretty clear view quite a long way up the tower. Right, okay. Yeah. Thank you. And in terms of your conclusions about what you've drawn on the night, is it fair to say that you remain of the view that the system, there's evidence to suggest that the system did operate on the night uh, in the way it was intended to for the short period of, that you would expect it to work for? Yes. Thank you. Mr Chairman, um, I've got no further questions. Right. Or, well, actually, I had lots more questions, but I've really pared back to the essential well, that's, that's given the time. Well, that's your decision, yes. Um, but um, I'm happy to stop there and, and take up further questions that are suggested. So perhaps if we could have until 5-2, um, if that's OK. Yes, you, you think you need... Well, if you don't need as long as that, will you ask the usher to come and Of course, us? yeah. yeah. Miss Lay, just so that you understand how we work these things, and when Council gets to the end of her questions, we have to have a short break, partly to enable her to take stock, but mainly to enable others who are following the proceedings from elsewhere to suggest question that perhaps we ought to put to you. So we'll stop now. We'll, um, we'll resume at five to five, and then at that point we'll see if there's any more questions that we need to ask you. No All problem right? for me. No right. problem. Thank you. Well, if you go to the usher now, that'll be good. Thank you. Right, we'll say five to five unless you send for a sooner. Thank you. Right. Thank you.
Would you ask Mr Lay to come back in, please? All right, Mr Lay, well, let's see if any more questions for you. Yes, Ms Grange? Uh, no, Mr Chairman, there are no further questions. Oh. <laughs> um, so, um, just to say thank you to Mr Lay for coming and assisting us with our inquiries today. Yes. Thank you. Well, we certainly are very grateful to you, Mr Lay. It's when we have to deal with quite complex and difficult questions, it's very often helpful to have more than one expression of opinion and mm -hmm. view on the subject because we get a better chance of seeing things in the round and maybe understanding them well as a result. So thank you very much for coming in. It's been very helpful to hear you, very interesting. And uh, now you're free to go. Thank you very much. It's, it's, a, it's been my honour to be here. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Grange. That must be it for today. Yes, it is. And before we leave, I'm just going to say a word of thanks publicly to those who are helping us to run these uh, proceedings. And the stenographer, of course, whose fingers we always uh, cause to ache by the end of a long day. I'm sorry about that, but thank you very much for putting up with us and, and for the documents manager and those behind the scenes who are still operating the live stream. So thank you all very much. So we shall resume with a new witness tomorrow morning. Yes, we have Dr Lane tomorrow morning. Uh, thank 10, you. And we shall do that at 10 o'clock. Yes, please. 10 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs>